Okay, great. Uh, thank you for that, Rosa. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us here tonight. We do have a hybrid meeting tonight. This is our first time, so we're hoping that everybody can bear with us tonight in case we have some bugs to iron out. Um, uh, we, we're just not sure because it's our first time. Uh, we do have quorum um, of PRAB members, so I will officially call this meeting to order at uh, 6.01. My first um, question is, would anybody like to make a motion to approve the agenda? Sunny? Okay, great. Do I have a second? Second. Perfect. Thank you, Elliot. Um, is there any discussion before we approve the agenda? Any questions? Okay, hearing no opposition, the motion passes and the agenda is approved. And I'll turn it over right now to Ali for um, items of discussion for future board meetings or um, items and tours. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, most immediately, I wanted to call the board's attention that on Wednesday, here in this very building, the Tate Municipal Building will be hosting an open house for the uh, Historic Places Plan. Tina's here and can share more if you have questions about that, but I know you're interested in being involved in the community and hearing conversations. At this open house, they'll be talking about the Historic Places Plan and specifically with the community about how the community can support our historic places through volunteerism and other methods. Um, the findings of the plan itself are, are less uh, exciting to most community members because they're about asset management and how we take care of them, even though folks agree they're important. So uh, the other thing I wanted to call your attention to is that there have been some changes in February coming up on February, uh, February 9th, and you will catch it in your next update. There's been some changes. The city council meeting gets adjusted or their agenda gets adjusted every single Monday based on uh, projects in flight and based on community context. February 9th, that, that study session is now. It will have the housing our community conversation, which will include participation by Boulder Housing Partners, who's the city's housing authority. It will not have the family homelessness conversation. A key city partner, EFA, is not available that evening, and so they're working to reschedule it. And the SAMPs, the Safe and Managed Public Spaces annual update is also being rescheduled. They will likely add the city's legislative agenda to that study session on February 9th. So I'd flag that. Um, if you don't want to listen live, you can always find council materials online and you can also watch it later. Um, their midterm check-in on February 23rd and 24th is where city council will review their work plan. So when city councils are elected, which in Boulder is in the odd years, they develop a two-year work plan. So we're in two year two of this council's work plan and they will spend two evenings revisiting their key priorities. Um, for parks and recreation, there are not a lot of impacts. Their major projects relate to planning and they relate to housing. However, we could see um, some shifts if they make space for more planning focus and support around civic area projects. Uh, the other item on your agenda that I wanted to call out is that coming up in March, we have several meetings. This In March and April last year, you had meetings every two weeks. That's a big ask of you. It's a big ask of our team, but there's a lot of work to do as we prepare for the budget. And so we're really um, looking forward to the study session that we'll have with you where we talk about our capital investment strategy and we talk about our fee policy. Uh, I believe a date has been set for that. It says TBD here, but I believe that was scheduled for April 2nd. It looks like, oh, this is missing some of those date updates, Rosa. Is that accurate? I believe our March meeting is on the unless I'm looking at the wrong PDF. My PDF says the March meeting is the 27th in person. I believe that meeting is actually the 20th. Sorry. And the study session is Monday, April 2nd. And so you'll have meetings book endings for April break, but April 3rd, thank you. You will have meetings book endings for spring break, but not over spring break. And then you'll have your regular April meeting on the 24th. So I just, I want to thank you in advance for your time. I also want to uh, thank you in advance for your thoughtfulness about how we'll onboard new members to that important work and getting them up to speed because people, as you know, um, especially Sunny and Anita, who are so fresh in it, you dive into prep right amidst budget season and anything we can do to support that and help folks feel comfortable in the role work. We're here for that. Um, can I interrupt for a second? I'm a little, yes. little confused. Um, so when is the city council going to be looking at the library reallocation the library um, library reallocation first conversation is March 9th early March and are we going to be asking for a chunk of that money we are going to be asking for about eight million dollars of that money so parks and recreation if you all remember the master plan that you well um I wonder if we're going future board items you might propose to add to the item um the agenda 
actually we can talk about it during our 2023 action items and the financial strategy how that probably would fit in that conversation i wonder if you could park you on that question okay yeah about just about how parks and recreation is managing its financial strategy right i want to i want to know how prav can assist in yep. helping you get hold of some of that right yeah yeah, we just clicked we clicked submit on Friday, and I would love to share more about that. It's okay. probably appropriate during our 2023 action plan conversation. Um, the other thing, I'm sorry, I just want to celebrate that on February 11th, we're hosting the Sweet Arts Dance for the first time in three years. This is an event for um, adults and a special small person in their life. It is an inclusive event for families, um, and it's... It's been happening in Boulder for over 15 years, and the team every year tries to make it better, and we're so thrilled to be welcoming people back. So if you're looking for something to do on February 11th and you have a special small person in your life, I highly recommend you take them on a date. My son is 14 and will be going bowling because he's he's not going to the Sweethearts games. So he'll be helping mm -hmm. blow up balloons, and then we'll be going bowling. The age range that we find is most appropriate for this event is about 3 to 11 years old. All right, that's all I have, Madam Chair. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, so next we'll go to public participation. And for the first time in a while, we have none, unless somebody has walked in. Rosa? Nobody. Okay. So um, anyway, we have no public participation. So we'll move on uh, to the consent agenda. Is that appropriate, Ali? Is that okay? Right on. Okay. Fantastic. So we're looking for an approval of minutes. Um, I so there's two minutes on your um, in your agenda. It's November 28th, 2022, and December 12th of 2022. So I'm asking first if there's any questions on the November 20th, 2022 um, minutes, or if you're comfortable making a motion on both, we could do that as well. I make a motion to approve both the minutes from November 28th and December 20th. Uh, December 12th. Great, Chuck. I'll second Sunny. that. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Sunny. Appreciate Can I interject? That. I actually have an edit to the December 12th minutes. Okay, okay then we the proper we, term we, for that. Well, then we have to back it up and then we'll yeah. let's just approve November 28th first. Yeah. So, Chuck, can you change your amendment or can you change your motion? Okay, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from November 28th, 2022. Perfect. And Sunny, are you okay seconding? Second that. <laughs> great. Okay. Great. Thank you for that. That's approved. And then so now we'll go to the 12th. And Elliot? Yeah. So and I'm sorry to do this, but the last page of the minutes has uh toward the bottom of the page, it says Prab had the following question as her comment. And then it says Elliot to replace Brock. Um first of all, it should say hood, I would assume, because right. it's me. Yeah. And Elliot's also a misspelled. But it doesn't. It doesn't say what I what. It doesn't actually like explain. Yeah. What the comment oh, or question was, and I believe that. it. If I believe it was, I was replacing Brock at the planning session for the next meeting, um, which I attended with you, Pam. So if the meetings could, if the notes could reflect that in yeah. some way, that would be awesome. Oh, I see. So what I we're on folks just to, we're on the same plane. We're on on page 11 of the packet and under item D, it said there was a motion to amend the agenda um, just to replace Brock at the agenda setting meeting. Crab had the following questions and the, the outcome was that Hood should replace Brock at the yeah. agenda setting meeting. We'll make that edit. Yeah. OK, fantastic. Thank you. I make a motion to approve the minutes as uh, modified. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Elliot. Thanks for catching that eagle eye. That's fantastic. Wonderful. Perfect. Okay. So the motion is approved. We've got those minutes. And so um, the next thing we will do is go for the updates from Allie. We'll pass it over to Allie Rhodes for the um, Parks and Rec updates that are not listed on the agenda. Thank you. And so I, I want to call out that this item of the agenda, it's called the consent agenda for from a Robert's rules holdover, right, of items that are not supposed to be controversial in nature and that you just approve with no question. Over time, they've evolved in Parks and Recreation to be updates from the department. And so that's why it's called the consent agenda. I know Elliot and I just had a nice conversation about maybe as you, you talk about updating the crowd handbook, we could call thing things that maybe make more sense. And especially as we talk about being welcoming and inclusive and having an environment that makes sense. So here are some updates that you can uh, approve on your, on your consent agenda. 
as always, we have updates from our planning team and from across the department and operations. There is work that happens every single day that we don't talk about. This is just some highlights and some um, great things that have happened in the last month or so. If you have questions, there are a lot of really smart people in this room and on this call who can answer them. I had a question, but I'm uh, I'm a little embarrassed to ask it, but I'm going to ask it. I wanted to know what was the what's the big deal about the badger? Like I know that he hasn't been around in a while, but like is he extinct? I don't know much about him. But I, it seemed like it was very exciting. Pam, I love that you asked that question because someone else was maybe wondering it. So thank you for being okay. brave. Our our senior manager for natural resources, Regina Elsner, manages that team okay. and, and has some information. Thank you. Yeah, so um, badgers are just a really cool um, species. I do not believe they're quite yet listed as a species of conservation concern in the state of Colorado, um, but they are pretty close because they require a pretty large home range um, and an undisturbed home range in order to be able to hunt and survive, especially in the winter months. Um, and so it's just really cool that we have enough um, land and undisturbed property that they that they have come back um, to that area. Um, and so, yeah, as you noted, the last time we were able to confirm a badger in the reservoir area was back in 2008. So this is a very welcome return to this predator, for this predator. And he's cute. Yeah. <laughs> Martina, could you add just something on the ecological benefits of having a predator like this on the North Shore? Because I know that, so as staff, we saw a lot more detail, right, about this. And I just found fascinating the difference just having a predator like this in that area can have. Yeah, so predators and especially sort of these higher level predators are great for um, helping keep ecosystems in check. And in particular, the badgers tend to prey on prairie dogs. Um, so that really helps keep those um, populations in check. Um, so they don't expand beyond um, healthy population levels. So predators are great. Um, it also helps us with vegetation management, making sure that we are able to keep healthy native ecosystems, um, native plant systems and communities. So what is the primary prey for the badger? Um, they eat a lot of small um, mammals, similar, like I said, to prairie dogs. Uh, they'll eat mice, voles, other things like that. Uh, my understanding about badgers is that you should not, members of the community should not attempt to approach them. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is why we we are very careful about um, not actually identifying where in the reservoir complex we have found them. Oh, okay. um, so yes, no, we we are trying even within our own staff trying to minimize disturbance. That's why we put out the motion cameras um, so that we are not actually going in and disturbing them as well. So, yep. Well, thank you. I have a question about the North Boulder Park um, process. So, um, sounds like we're going to be, be moving pretty quickly on renovating the bathrooms on the picnic shelter starting next month, I believe that's correct. Um, there's some discussion about collaborating with the Alpine Balsam plan. Is that, seems like there, there are a couple of things for the park. There's like the playground and the immediately surrounding infrastructure for that. And there are bigger issues with drainage that are related to Alpine Balsam. So are you separating those out and doing going to do the uh, playground this year and then worry about the other stuff later, or are you can delay the playground, do it all in one comprehensive um, approach? How, how is that going to be? Yeah, I can answer that one. Um, so oh, can you just introduce yourself for the first time? Oh, sorry. Absolutely. Hi, I'm Tina Briggs, Parks Planner, uh, Project Manager on this particular project. Um, so <clears throat> on the North Boulder Park playground renovation, they are two separate but related projects. And so they are both about, well, one is about drainage and one is about the playground renovation, but we know even in the playground renovation, we've had some drainage issues with it sheeting across the playground and wiping the pea gravel out. So what we're looking at is, what is the core of that issue and how do we fix the core while we're tearing the playground down anyways? 
um, rather than kind of putting a Band-Aid on it. <clears throat> and as it turns out, that drainage actually uh, meets up with the alpine balsam um, improvements that'll be happening. So they, they will happen on separate timelines and be separate projects, but we want to make sure that they're coordinated in the planning section. And, and that's why I've taken just a few minutes to step back to make sure we're fully coordinating that and then also making sure that we're fully addressing the issues um, of drainage in the north side. So it is separate but related. Okay, great. Thanks. Can I just add that we asked the exact same question? We know folks have been waiting for this playground, but it doesn't make sense to not have the thoughtful approach to the drainage that Tina, Tina's mentioning. And I really appreciate it because it's it's one of those times where it's um there's there's some good expression, right? Like in for a penny, in for a pet. Like it's just it's it it will be smarter in how we spend money because we're not um measure once, measure twice, cut once. Yes. I think is the expression I'm looking for here. I had one more question unless the board had other questions. Okay. So on the South, South Boulder Recreation Center alley, I was just, I was just, I couldn't figure it out. Was it a new pump that died or was it a pump that died while it was closed? Like I couldn't, I, I couldn't figure it out. It was a very old pump that was nearing the end of its life cycle and we were planning for yeah. its replacement anyway and it failed it's it, it failed a little too soon. But you got the pump replaced so fast so you already had one on order? I'll, I'm going to let Scott Schottenberger, our deputy director who has oversight for recreation. Okay, I'm just first. impressed because yeah. uh, from my knowledge, it takes so long for me to get a boiler pump. So I'm like, how'd you do that? <laughs> we jumped up and down. Okay. Uh, we, we actually contacted several companies and um, instead of just going with the, the cheapest product, we also looked at the timeline and the amount of downtime that we would uh, be faced with. And so we we were able to find a company that was able to, to get to us awfully quick, which was wonderful with the holiday season. So um, yeah, I, I'd say part of it is we got lucky. Well, I just want the board to know that what they did was magical because it is unheard of to get a pump replaced that fast. It really is in the industry. So I just really, uh, kudos when I read that, I was like, you guys kind of glossed over that, but like from the profession, that's a huge, huge deal you did to get that pump going. So thank you for that. Yeah, and unfortunately, we know already that we have a pump down over at Spruce um, that we need to get replaced as well. And so we're going to try and get that ordered as soon as possible so that we do hit the timeline for, for opening up Spruce for the summer. So uh, hopefully we have just as good a luck. Well, thank you for being proactive on that. I appreciate it. Any other questions before we move on? Ali, you also did um, operations updates too, right? All in one? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So there's, we don't have any action items and we don't have any matters for discussion. So we'll move on to the matters from the department. So I'm assuming you're going to pass it maybe to Megan. I am. Megan is actually off this evening. So I'm going to oh. cover this item for her. Okay. She has family okay. in town and we like to let people hang out with their families. Sounds good. Um, and so... The intent of this item, you all had an incredible conversation in December, and I, I guess I also want to just thank you for leaning into that conversation. I think you're leading the way in the city and not only being interested in the conversation, but the way you're engaged in it and aware of the city's commitment to racial equity gets to be commended. So thank you for, for digging in on that. We said that we would take your comments and synthesize them to see and that so that we could then pass them along to the clerk's office. For some of it, we've missed the boat for 2023 recruitment. That is happening. Now, um, however, all of your comments, if when we hear back from you tonight, if they're accurate, we'll make sure that they inform future efforts. Um, and so I think this is really we don't have a presentation here. It's just an open comment of did, did we capture your feedback? Is there anything that we need to add, edit or. Or other. And I also just, I guess this is a, a time to let you all know that you will have two vacancies anticipated in this upcoming cycle, and you have five applications. You're tied with housing advisory boards for the most. Other boards and commissions have one or maybe two. Prab continues to be a popular place to be. And the deadline is the end of the month? I'll confirm that for you while you guys start your discussion. Rosa might know off the top of her head, but I'll look it's it up. 31st. I think it's the 31st. So we have five applications for two spots already, and we've got 
is if historically that in historical trends, do people tip like do we tend to get the most applications like in the last few days? Correct. That is that is the typical trend. So I, I would love for two spots. I think ten at least would be a good number of of applicants to make sure that that um, we continue to have a strong board. It is the thirtieth. Elliot and Russ, I knew their stuff. I think we said the thirty first. Yeah. yeah. Monday, January thirtieth. <laughs> okay. So whatever you all are doing to help support recruitment, it's working. Good. And we do have signs up in the recreation centers. I know that was one of your recommendations. It's um, we also passed along the recommendation that in the future years we use one of the city's graphic designers to make a, a compelling and. Yeah, I just want to say as a comment, I think that staff has done a really great job capturing what I believe we discussed. So this is really good. I did too, Ali. I was really I thought the notes taken were very copious. I thought they were really well done. Anyone else? <clears throat> Um, the only comment I would make, and it, potentially it's a question, but um, uh, we had discussed as part of this plan updating the handbook, and I had volunteered to kind of spearhead that, but we didn't really, as a board, decide that we wanted to do that, and nobody like voted to delegate it to a certain person or establish a timeline for edits to that. And I wondered if we wanted to raise that now or if we want to um, table that discussion for next time. I offer the suggestion of uh, taking that up in matters for board in today's yeah. uh, meeting. So does that mean we'll talk about it later in the agenda, like in on prep matters or under that would be my suggestion to add it to add, maybe make it a C? Or what do we need to put it on the next agenda alley? Uh, I think you can just discuss it under general crab matters. Okay, sounds good. You're not going to take any formal action or discuss anything substantial or controversial. So I think that's appropriate. Okay. I'm writing it down, Chuck, but if I forget, remind me. Okay. Okay. Sorry, sounds good. Yeah, well, while I'm interjecting, um, Rosa, there are three chat messages. I, I don't know if this is your only screen. I just want to make sure that like Anita's not trying to get in or... No, I'm monitoring the chat and um, it was Mary okay. Scott. So, okay, good. no, no, but thank you. Thank you. I should have, I should have announced that in the beginning, but um, it's me and Mary Scott talking about, she was trying to get on. Okay. If it's okay, we'll move on to BPR 2023 action plan. Allie. I'm ready. I thought you were asking the board. Let's do it. <laughs> oh, no. I, I, you know what I yeah. did form that in a question? No, I did. Yeah. yeah. So let me be more uh, imperative. We're moving on. <laughs> I'm ready. And Rosa, I'm not in the Zoom. So if you would pull up this presentation, I would appreciate it. It's the BPR 2023 action plan. While she does that, I'll uh, just share that we're really excited to share the work we have outlined for this coming year with the members of the board. Um, the the action plan, you'll see we have a graphic in just a moment, is where we, uh, can't look up, we just distracted, I'm just trying to multitask. Um, Rosa, it's in the Pratt folder for tonight. There you go, look at that. All right, awesome. Um, and I mean, we'll start with, and this slide will be up in just a moment, is why do we do this? Why do we plan? I've, I've been in the department for 20 years. We did not always have an action plan, but with our 2014 master plan, we made a promise that the plan was not going to sit on the shelf and that every year we would look at it and say, what is most important next? And so if you go to the next slide, you'll see this, the graphic from this current plan that says every single year, we're going to have this, this five-step process. We're going to look at um, the, the, the master plan and everything we heard from the community, right? You all gave a lot of input, our elected officials gave a lot of input, uh, and we're gonna use that and develop an annual action plan. And that is uh, where we'll implement the goals and initiatives that are in the strategic plan, but also the fiscally constrained alternatives of the planning scenarios. And so um, I'm gonna present this item with Scott and we 
never, we never, uh, we never okay. finalized who's doing what, but I'm going to have him cover the next slide because I know that he's capable and ready to talk a little bit about how we do this here. So absolutely. One of the important things is, is all of these plans tie together. So we start off at that top level with the city of Boulder, the priorities and values that um, the organization holistically has looked at. And then, of course, our guiding uh, document is our master plan. And so we want to tie everything into our master plan and make sure that uh, those overarching policy and goals in the master plan uh, really are addressed within our action plan items. And so what's really exciting about this action plan and the things we're going to talk about specifically today is this is the plan that moves our department forward at all times. That growth mindset that we try and instill in all of our staff and really try and continue to move forward is, is really guided by this action plan that we've decided to, uh, to implement this year, and that's what we're going to cover. Aside from that, we also have team work, work plans. So, for example, our aquatics team has their work plan, or our fitness team, or forestry, and, and each of the different areas have their own work plans that roll up into our action plan that, that really, truly roll all the way up into our polar uh, priorities and values. And on top of that, this time of year, we're just kind of wrapping up our uh, performance evaluations and our appraisals of our staff, and we do some goal setting for the next year and really look at individual performance goals and how we're getting people to continue to move forward and think holistically uh, about these plans and how their growth can help implement the and, and lead to success in the teamwork plan and our department action plan. So that's kind of how this all ties together. And it's a really important piece to, to our success and getting everybody on board and the wheels moving in the right direction at all times. We call this our, that was perfect. We call this our nesting dolls graphic because we used to hear from our employees, there's so many plans. Why do you plan so much, <laughs> right? And, and But now I actually heard this last year, I'm kind of sick of hearing about the nesting dolls. And I call that a huge win because it means people get it and that the message has sunk in. Um, at the heart of everything is each individual. And that's why it's important, just the next slide. I want to tell you that even before we talk about our action plan, that that is probably less than 15% of the work that we do. 85% of what we do is just delivering this system. It's operating the parks, it's operating the recreation centers, um, making sure that those things are prepared to serve us well into the future. Um, and, and I call that out for a couple of reasons. One, because it's the work that is unsung and uncelebrated most of the time. I, I tell our teammates that they need to remember that on any given day, there's thousands of people having an incredible time in our system. Skiing in, in North Boulder Park or, you know, doing all the different things that happen in our parks every single day and we don't hear from them. We hear from the person who um, thought the water fountain should have looked cleaner or the other thing, but the work we do every single day is, is the backbone of the system. And it's a lot. We have done a lot of really thoughtful work the last, uh, really, I mean, we, we've done it for 10 years, but the last three, we've had to get razor, razor focused on how much time does that take? Because our teammates are tired and they're working very hard. You know how hard they've been working the last three years. Um, there's not a lot of capacity for more outside of managing the system. So it's really important to understand that any new initiatives we take on almost always require us to stop or pause something else if we're going to be thoughtful about our employees' well-being and capacity. And the other thing I'm going to point out is that we're about to talk about our 2023 work action plan. It is ambitious. Most of it will carry forward into 2024. Some of it will be paused or delayed. I can promise that now because something else will happen or um, something will take more time than we thought, or it'll just seem in three months when we relook at things, we'll think, eh, that's not as important. It's going to wait so that we can give more resources to this or because we just don't have the capacity. So with that, I'm going to talk about some of our department-wide efforts. So when we talk about what goes on our action plan, these are typically initiatives that carry across more than one of our service areas. They um, advance an initiative of the master plan, and they're typically time-bound. They're not ongoing work. So if you go to the next slide, uh, I'm going to talk about most of these, but I'm going to let Scott start with the Summer Squad because he's our sponsor for that item. And I know you guys are eager to hear about what we're doing for staffing. Well, being that this is my eighth week here on the job, and I'm, I'm really excited. I've heard over and over again, uh, why can we not find enough lifeguards or, or we don't have enough park ops staff uh, and those kind of things. And we know how important it is for us to have a, um, our facilities open at this point and services happening for the community. And so we've developed a matrix team and we actually meet tomorrow morning. It'll be our first uh, meeting of the year to get together and talk about kind of our one boulder approach to hiring, training, onboarding, 
uh, recruiting and, and, and bringing in our summer employees. And so this is a, a really exciting time for me, especially because I've been able to reconnect with the community I grew up in, which is awesome, um, and working with CU and the, the high schools here in town and some other community organizations. But as a, as a matrix team, this group is really going to be focused from starting right away tomorrow all the way through to get us through the summer and make sure that we're not only recruiting and, and hiring and, and implementing processes that allow uh, individuals to, to have a seamless transition into this role, but we need to retain those employees and hopefully be a great place to work so they bring their friends and, and people they know as well. So that's the main initiative of the summer squad and um, and we're ready to roll. And, and the goal is uh, you know, once we open those outdoor pools, we really need to be ramped up and, and parks get going and, and our camps and all those programs. So um, it starts now and um, I'm very excited about it. So if you know anyone that wants to, to work for Parks and Rec, let me know, we'll, we'll make it happen. There's a lot in that item and, and you'll hear updates at a regular basis over the next several months. But I just, I want to point out, Scott Scott said it starts tomorrow. I, I'll just appreciate it. Actually started the, his second day here where we said, this is this is your most important thing. When everybody said, what do we want to, you know, we many members of the leadership team, we've had a reduced level of leadership for the past three years. And we said, we're bringing on a new guy. How can he help? And everybody said staffing and he dove right in. He has met with both high schools. He's connected with CU and already renewed our contract for, um, student work study and working with BBSD uh, workforce development. So I'm really excited to see what some energy and some capacity is doing to this work. It's very exciting. Each of the initiatives that we're going to talk about has a sponsor that is a member of our leadership team, but to, for efficiency, I'm going to provide a high level overview of them. And then if you have questions, I might tap someone on the team. The capital investment strategy, this is something that you're going to be hearing about in the coming months. In 2016, we developed a 10-year plan for how we would invest in our assets. That's where we got the focus of um, replacing Scott Carpenter Pool and the facility at the Boulder Reservoir, those major projects. So we're going to be coming to you in March with some choices because we're, we have this many projects and this much money. And so we're going to be coming to you in March to update that 10-year plan. And we're really excited about that work. Mark, as I was sharing with folks uh, before the meeting, we have an incredible planning team and they are doing rock solid work. And I'm excited for you to see it and to help us help us prioritize. Um, asset management, Mary, uh, I know you'll be interested in this. You're always eager about the beehive data. You all are interested in how we make decisions about how we take care of systems. Um, fun fact, we launched Beehive in September of 2019, and some teams were able to take it and run with it, and other teams were not able to get up to speed with, because of the pandemic and the fact that we've been just all hands on deck, heads down to operate our system. So um, again, great new members of our team. Mark is, uh, I would say, an expert in asset management in many ways, and he and I, along with others, are helping to make sure that we're using our tools so that we can make data-driven decisions and taking care of our assets. And so by the end of the year, the hope is, is that across our department, all of our teams are using our tools to catalog our inventory, know its condition, and use that data to plan for the management of the system. The JEDI team is justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. As you'll recall from last year, we shared with you that city council accepted the city's first ever racial equity plan. In it, it's or the work of that is organized uh, around several categories. The first is that everyone gets it, and that requires uh, training of all city employees. The second major pillar of the city's racial equity plan is to justly do the work. And to make sure all departments can do that, it requires that every department have um, a JEDI team that can do a department scan. And what that will do is look for areas where our services could be furthering systemic racism. Um, I'm going to give an example here because I think sometimes that, that these are uncomfortable topics and people don't know what that means. So I'm going to give, give an example. If we only operated our park system based upon complaints, we might only hear from people who speak English, who have access to computers, and who trust their government. There are members of our community who don't speak English, who don't have access to a computer and don't trust the government. And so by not addressing that barrier, we are operating a system, a system that is furthering systemic racism. We don't want to do that. And so that department scan will be identifying ways that we might be perpetuating racism and ways that we can help make sure our services are more equitable and inclusive. Safety committees. This is very exciting to a lot of us. Safety is something that is critically important. Um, 
Um, workforce is the heart of everything that we do, and we need to make sure our people are safe at work. This is a leading practice. It's something that's gone quiet over the last several years because of our workload and our busyness. Stephanie Monroe is leading this charge department-wide. We have a land operations team and a recreation team. They are meeting, they are setting their goals for the year, and um, safety is exciting. CAPRA, this is the Commission for the Accreditation of Parks and Recreation Agencies. We wrote a lot about this in the memo because you're going to be hearing more and more about CAPRA. So what we actually talked about ways that you might be involved in various CAPRA efforts. If you go to the next slide, because we're going to, we just talked to you about resources and limitation, I just we want to make sure you understand why we think that CAPRA accreditation is important. There are benefits to the community. There are benefits to our team. We can save money. It will drive, Scott talked earlier about a, a mindset of continuous improvement. The accreditation process is ongoing. You have to recertify every five years. And so you don't get to just check the box and say you're done. You have to keep going. Um, because I have some institutional knowledge at this point, I'll just share with you all that, that our team's not really been interested in this in the past. We're not, um, we're not a department or an org, or agency that has cared about accolades or rewards. We, we want meaningful outcomes and things that make a difference to the community. But in 2019, we asked our team, hey, this CAPRA thing keeps coming up. Are you interested? And they said, yeah, we are. We are because it'll help us document policy and practice, something that we can grow in. And they said, because you know what? We do really good work and we want to be recognized. Um, that, that desire to document our policies and practices and, and the need to have more documentation came out again during our master planning process. A lot of our processes are really sophisticated. Sometimes they're overly complicated. Something that was said of another department in the city through an organizational assessment was, if you're familiar with Occam's razor, it's the principle that the simplest solution is most often true we tend to apply the opposite across the city. And so that's why one of our mottos for the year is to keep it simple. And certainly as we go down the CAFRA path. So um, we're very excited about this accreditation. You will come along that journey with us. We hope that next October you'll be celebrating with us. We'll go to Georgia on the national conference and be accredited and get to bring that back to Boulder and celebrate with you all because you're going to be a part of the journey. Good question. Would accreditation help with insurance costs or any other um, any other aspects sure. of it, there's, there definitely are financial savings in a lot of ways. One, because you're going to be more efficient by documenting some of your policies for insurance. The city's self-insured in a lot of ways. But when you think of like workers comp, there's a, there's two chapters that address um, risk. One is um, about risk and security. And I, I've kind of bucketed that as the environment around us and how do we make sure that people are safe at work through training with the police department and active shooter drills and um, safety around different threats. That's an entire chapter of practices that we'll have to achieve. There's another chapter that is around safety and it's the work that I just mentioned that Stephanie is leading. So what's cool about CAPRA is a lot of the work we're already gonna do is gonna achieve those standards, but ch chapters eight and nine specifically should reduce costs because we should, um, we do pretty good with workers' compensation claims and employee safety, but our hope is to do even better, which should save us money. I, I think there are other ways where we will save money. Um, Maybe not directly, but indirectly. I know we spend a lot of safe time, staff time looking for or trying to make decisions on things that that um, probably are accepted policy, but it's buried in like five crab memos because we didn't document the fee policy is a great example. If you're a new member of our team and you ask me what our fee policy is, I refer you to the May 2019 crab memo where the crab last had a robust conversation about resident, non-resident, age-based discounts, et cetera. So that's going to get translated into documents and there's going to be administrative savings. So on the last slide, when you're talking about your initiatives, um, list so capital investment strategy and asset management and i've never asked this before i've always been curious about it. how do you distinguish between asset management and capital investment strategy because they seem to kind of play on each other events. did mark give you like candy and ask you to ask <laughs> <laughs> Oops, take it. i'm gonna let mark davis and your senior manager answer that question so like up to like nine <laughs> Two minutes. Yeah. Two minutes. No, seriously, it, uh, completely related asset management, existing facilities, good fair to work condition. What do they look like? You're managing those in that beehive system. Meanwhile, you've got a capital investment program looking to build new assets or do what the city calls enhancement, replacement of assets. 
Meanwhile, that capital investment program is also then tied into Beehive because which are the ones we need to bring up to good fair condition? When I worked in Oregon, a typical rule was like 70% takes care of what you got, 30% is like investment and replacement are new. So it's balancing that. And you'll see us come back in March, uh, sorry, the April study session, talking to you about what is that balance and how do we get that right? So yeah, you're right, they're completely integrated. They just happen to run separately because asset management also has the management of the asset, not just the investment. Thank you. That was brief. That was I would have one other term to the asset management. It is that day-to-day -day cyclical maintenance and the ongoing preventative maintenance. So there's a lot more maintenance in asset management than there is the capital investment tend to be the larger six-figure million-dollar projects that take a, take something. If something is all the way down to fair, it's not just, just good maintenance that's going to fix it. It's going to be a capital infusion. So like the new development in Norfolk Park versus like tightening the screws on playgrounds that exist. Exactly. Excellent example. Yeah, we should develop a good graphic on like, so for a playground, there's asset management, there's the there's the safety checks that happen on a regular basis, there's the regular replacement of a belt swing, that, that's asset management. The capital investment is when is that, that playground past its 15 year life cycle and should we be replacing it? It's like a day-to-day -day work order that you put in. Funny enough, I did a slide recently, actually, just even for our own staff to talk through the difference between the two. So. We'll happily bring that name as part of the study session because that that helps explain it and helps me make the decisions on it, doesn't it? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions before we move to the recreation focused initiatives? I have one. Um, I'm going to be an outgoing member soon, and I'm interested in that safety committee. Just wanted to say that. I don't know if that's even a thing if you're not in the city. Meaning like our members of the community a part of the work. Right. Yeah. Mary, where it might be appropriate is if you have subject matter expertise that you could be a speaker to the group, or if there's resources you think we should be aware of, you should give us a call on April 1st. Okay. Because I, I think there's a lot of ways where you have expertise and work that you've wanted to be a part of our work, but not been able to because of the conflict with FRAB. So I, I hope we go for lunch in April. So I'll call. I'll call out that partnership with the community, right? Mary connected us with a colleague for our um, employee workshop in October to talk about mental well being and self care. And it was incredible. We have these resources right here at our community hospital that can help us take care of our workforce. So, yes, we'll talk in April, Mary. All right. So, we have three. I guess I want to pause and make sure. Um, let's do a 10 second pause to make sure if there's other questions on those other items before we have Scott talk about recreation. I'm okay. Everybody? People in the room? Making sure on the virtual we might need like the 15 second awkward yes, pause, I right? Like we've been going to 10, but with 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 hybrid, we're gonna maybe go 15. Just be really we can all be comfortable with some awkward silence. Um the other thing I want to flag is so I'll have talk, Scott talk about these recreation focused items, and then I'm gonna talk about how that relates to the funding gap in Chuck's question of the library dollars. Does that work? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to stand for a little while. Please do. Do whatever you need to be comfortable. Do okay. you need anything? No. Okay. Perfect. So um, in talking about the three items that are, are really more recreation focused, um, we want to be very intentional with what we do and the services that we provide and what's offered to the community. We don't want to just have programs because that's what we've always done. And so um, the first piece of this is creation of the creation of a, a program plan, which actually ties back into our CAPRA accreditation, which is, is wonderful. And this is really 75% done. It's pulling the information together and, and how we program. Um, understanding how programs are operated through uh, our organization is extremely important. From there, we go into a fee policy document. And this is what really codifies the existing practices that we're putting into place. What do we charge for the services that we offer, the programs that we offer, and um, and how do we communicate that to the public? And that that fee policy really needs to be uh, something that is is basically outlining what is the uh, really what is the support that's provided by external funding? What should people pay uh, versus what do they pay? What do we charge? And, and looking at the uh, the cost recovery model and and those uh, dollars associated with that. And so this is a, a next really important piece so that we can communicate to the rowing group. So we can communicate to um, any user group that we work with. Um, this is the fee and this is how much 
uh, we're going to need to charge for those fees. And, um, and that's supported by PRAB all the way up to city council. The last piece of that is, is really creating a, a level of service. Um, just because we can do it doesn't mean we should do it. And so really understanding a level of service and what the needs of the community are. This piece, we're probably going to dive into a little bit more, and it's going to take a little bit longer to get this one uh, finalized. But we need to be forward thinking. So as we're putting in budget requests for 2024 and, uh, and further years out, we really have to have a plan on what is the level of service and what we offer to the community. We also don't want to duplicate the services that are already happening within the community. We want to make sure that we're complementing other programs uh, that are happening here in the community. So that's some of the focus around recreation initiatives. Is there anything I can answer for you on those? Okay. Anything to add? Yeah, well, uh, what I'll add is that the level of service conversation ties directly to the library funding. So if proud members will reflect back to last April and May when we were talking about the 2023 budget, we said we are short. And we are going to ask for general fund money. And if we don't get it, we're going to come back to you and we're going to talk about reducing services. City Council, in approving the 2023 budget, they approved a one-time funding to Parks and Recreation to cover that gap. And, and Central Finance said, we're going to propose that. We don't think the general fund has the funding to provide that on an ongoing basis, but we'll do it for one year. And in that year, you need to have a level of service conversation. Are you gold plating? Are you doing too much? And maybe you don't need this much money. If you reduced services somewhere, you wouldn't need more general fund dollars. And so this ties to the library reallocation because we have submitted um, over $8 million in funding requests. So the master plan, if you'll remember, it identifies about a $6 million funding gap based on the math that we did in 2020 2020 and 21. Well, cost escalation since then, as well as improved cataloging and condition assessments of our inventories, we, we have that number um, a whole lot higher. So we've submitted requests to take care of what we have. So we have um, requests for more people in park maintenance. We have requests for more dollars to do better with our athletic fields, our tennis courts, our parking lots, our restrooms, our shelters. And we have requests for recreation. We think we're doing really good community benefit work and we don't want to reduce services. So we've asked for funding for financial aid. We've asked for funding for age-based discounts. We've asked for funding for our programs with people with disabilities and YSI. And we've asked for funding to actually do more. Uh, in the 2023 budget, we asked for a position to improve our navigation and connection with um, non-English speaking community members and with folks who don't typically access parks and recreation services and it one isn't funded. So we've asked for, if you think of the master plan, mostly we've asked for funding to address our funding gap and that fiscally constrained planned alternative. But in some areas, we've also asked for more because we think that aligns for this money. The library money, there's about $10 million that's going to be available because voters approved the library district. Um, and so whichever way people voted on it, there's now money available in the city's budget to be reallocated. Um, I have heard conversations that that money was being spent on social infrastructure, and so maybe it should be continued to be spent on social infrastructure. So we're making lots of asks. So in the normal budget process, um, the city presents a proposed budget to council and there is an iteration and it's a coordinated budget. You, you don't go in and say, this is what parts of recreation want. It's all coordinated to the city manager. Is this request also being coordinated to the city manager and has her okay, or is this? A That's a really good question. So here's what, here's what the process is right now. Last week, departments across the city submitted requests and they did what we did and said, this is an incredible opportunity for new and ongoing money. Boulder typically, can get one-time capital dollars, right? The Community Culture Resilience and Safety Tax approved with 80% approval. Ongoing money is a little harder. Um, and so in February, there's going to be an internal conversation from the executive budget team where they take all of those requests and they prioritize them based on the citywide lens. Those will go to, council has a financial strategy committee, they'll vet them. Whatever package they put together, council will discuss on March 9th. They're having a special study session on this reallocation so that all of this isn't hashed out through the 2024 budget process. There's enough to hash out as you develop a budget. The idea is, is that some early guidance will help the city develop a budget that aligns with what council's wishes are. So, Chuck, I think the, the short answer to your question is it will happen in tandem with the 2024 budget development with an early, um, an early check in with city council about how they'd like to see the money reallocated. 
Mayor, I, I guess I wasn't asking about coordination with the 2024 budget process, but whether this 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 request is out of phase with the normal correct budgeting process, right? But is there a parallel process for this for the library funds, or the city is vetting it and presenting a package to council? for the library fund reallocation. Yes, that is happening in okay. preparation for the March 9th study okay. session. Got it. Is that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I got a little confused when you mentioned the 2024 budget. Well, so right now there's this list citywide of asks, right? What would you do with more money? And they actually created some initial criteria, right? Um, around it should be either supporting a core operational need, it should be enhancing an existing program, or if you think there's a need to grow or improve a program, you, you could do that as well. But you have to show alignment with the city's equity goals, with the city's strategic framework. So we, our team did incredible work as always, but they wrote very thoughtful analysis and we have 10 submissions that total about $8 million. Those are getting evaluated by the city's um, executive budget team and then the council financial strategy committee to prepare a package for council to discuss on March 9th. Okay. That conversation should give guidance for developing the 24 budget. It won't actually allocate the money or give final direction, but hopefully it gives enough information that we can prepare a 24 budget that is um, lighter on talking about the library's 10 million because there's 400 million that we need to talk about. Gotcha. So is there anything that we as Prad can do to be supportive of this process? I mean, it sounds like there's a whole procedure to go here. I don't know if in, in the in the committee that's going to review the city's uh, the proposal to council, if there's a role for us to play, or if it goes to council, is there a role for us to play in terms of being supportive? Because Personally, I've been very supportive of, of the allocation of funds that you've outlined, uh, supporting the key equity objectives and trying to improve some of our, um, replace some of our loss capacity and expand some of our capacity as the community has indicated they want. The PRAB will have a formal role as we develop the 2024 budget. So you saw in your future board, we're going to start coming to you in, in February. We're going to outline our approach and our timeline for developing the 24 budget. In March, April, and May, we're going to consult with you on the capital budget and the operating budget, and you're going to approve the capital budget, and your input should be reflected in that operating budget and the fees and the services we provide. Council typically asks, either in the meeting or in the study session, and the memos will say is, what did the board and commission say about this request, and what is their input? So it'll be reflected formally in that way. Um, as far as for the library reallocation, I ask ask the question of how, you know, would boards and commissions be consulted? What does that look like? I don't think the time is allowing for that in, in a formal way, other than that everything we submitted is outlined in the master plan that you all had heavy guidance in, right? So I would say your voice is reflected in that way. And Ali, that was my question. I don't know if you can see my hand up. It was just that there won't be any like behind the scenes coming up with something that we haven't all already discussed over the years of needs in the community. Like, I don't want to say harebrained scheme, but you know, oh, we could use money for a brand new thing. Uh, none of this conversation and decisions should happen uh, out of the public eye. Of course, I'm sure people all over this community are dreaming about what they could do with $10 million. But decisions will happen in public view, in meetings like this, in meetings with city council. The financial strategy committee has three members of council. Their meetings are televised and available to the public. That, did I answer your question, Mary? Um, yes, just that our, our, the Parks and Rec, is not going to, your people who worked very hard aren't coming up with brand new innovative ideas that we haven't all discussed they're basically going yeah. off of the needs that we've expressed over the years in a number of documents it's specifically from the parks and recreation Thank master you. plan Thank um, you. yeah all of our hopes and dreams should be in that document any other questions Good luck. <laughs> right? It's yeah. an incredible and an exciting opportunity. Um, Thank you. Yeah. I'm very excited. I, I would not bet that we get $8 million, but I think we will. 
we have, we're going to get to see some once in a career and generational change. Good. When is, when is council going to make the decision on uh, allocating? Or... Right. So they're on the March 9th study session. They don't take action and they don't give formal direction. They can give guidance that will staff will take to heart as we build the 2024 budget. So their typical timeline. So the formal action will take when they approve the 24 budget because that's when the money is available. That is typically in October. So the typical timeline is that they have one, if not two study sessions in late August or early September. They have a first, second, sometimes a third reading starting at the end of September and into October. So that's when they'll have the formal discussions. They'll take action on the budget. But at the study session, they're going to give all of the departments <laughs> a sense of where they want to go. I, I, my hope is, is that um, they're able to come to some agreement as to how this money should be prioritized and spent. So you guys can appropriately budget. Yeah. Extra. So again, I mean, the city's budget overall is, I, I, I don't, I shouldn't make up numbers. It's a lot of money. It's over $400 million, I think for 2024, $10 million is, is not a lot. It's, it's less than five per What is that? 5% would be 40 million, 10 million. No. Anyway, it's, yeah. Who, who's a math person? Brian Berry's like jumping up and down to give you that number. It's less than 5%, right? <laughs> Brian Berry. <laughs> oh, I don't do the math quick in my head. Yes. It, it's a small fraction of the overall budget. So the hope is to get guidance. So again, that whole conversation in the fall should be focused on the whole budget. It could be dominated by this library conversation. That wouldn't serve the city well. Did I answer your question? Yes. Okay. Um, the other thing I will note is that this fee policy, is, as Scott noted, we do intend to bring that to city council at a study session in April and talk about the level of service for a couple of reasons. But the biggest is that we know that the minute someone does not like our fees, they write a letter to Crab or they write a letter to city council. And we want folks to understand the choices that are being made and the policy that is governing our fees so that um, I'm going to steal from Rachel Friend when she, she approved our, when they approved our master plan, our council member said, you're looking for cover. Absolutely, we are looking for cover. Our team gets beat up all the time about fees. People don't like to pay fees. And we want a rock solid policy that makes life easier for everybody, including our customers. It can be really vague and unclear sometimes. All right, thank you. We have yeah, can I have one ask? Yeah. Can I just ask, since um, I did do that so fast, can I leave 15 seconds for any members of my team if I missed something important for oh, them to absolutely. chime in and, and, and just add? It's We're not all in the room, and so I can't read people's faces if I totally botched something. Sure. And so I just, team, this is, this is your chance. If I missed something important or misspoke, please speak now and clarify and make it better. It would be great to see their faces. I only, I, I only see the sheet. Perfect. Thank you. I see Stacy starting to talk. It looks like you're muted, Stacy. Thank you for coming on. Can I point out that Jackson Height, our incredible business services manager, who you all know well, is in Africa. So while we've been coordinating all of this work, Stacy's been leading it and she has done an incredible job. Um, and as soon as she's unmuted, it looks like she's got something to say. There she goes. Yeah, great. I just wanted to chime in very quickly just on the uh, City of Boulder's 2023 approved budget. It's uh, 500, um, I'm sorry, 513 million. Um, so we have about 354 out of the operating and 159 uh, for capital expenditure. So just wanted to quickly jump in and just clarify that. That's a big one. I was off by $100 million. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Stacey. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> All right, team, last call. Wonderful. Madam Chair, thank you for that moment. I appreciate it, and I appreciate the work of this team. We're doing really cool things for the community. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Uh, our next item, oh, go ahead. No, no, it's you. We're moving on to the I was just going to say, matters for the department. Our next item is an update on the flat iron golf facility. The project manager on this is our um, city senior planner, Tina Briggs, and she is getting organized here to share some information with you. 
Yeah, Rosa, do you want to? I, I'm not able to share my screen for me, but you can the um, presentation is in the prep folder as well. You're finding that. I might see if we can plug in this desk so that you can charge here. It's okay. I have enough to get through the presentation. It's fine. I'm guessing it's, it's not. Can, can you can it's 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 Well, I can, I can do it without it in front of me, too. So it's okay. Oh, no, go back one. What is the back one folder? There you go, first one. Thank you for doing that. All right, well, I'll just get started while those are coming up. Um, so we're just talking about the Flatirons Golf Course facility design. Most of what I'll talk about was in your memo, um, but I have a few extra things and I thought the pictures were kind of small. And what I realized I did is I didn't attach the PDF so you could hit the JPEG and have a blow up on your screen. So I will fix that. Um, and those um, images are also gonna be available on the project webpage. So um, tonight we'll just kind of do a quick overview. I know a few of you are really familiar with this project and maybe a few less so. so um, we'll just run through a little bit of overview with the overview, what the timeline looks like, and then I'll share some renderings of the new existing and new building, existing building, and parking lot. Um, the existing building stuff and the parking lot you've seen before, um, but we'll just, in case there's any questions, I want to have a couple of visuals. Uh, so starting with the overview, um, really just remembering this was to replace infrastructure that was destroyed. destroyed. In the 2013 flood, <clears throat> and it was given by direction from City Council in 2014. So this has been on the plan for quite a while. Um, and then what it really includes is a neighborhood restaurant. Um, we heard in the um, East Boulder community plan um, that restaurants was something that they were lacking on the east side. So this is intended to serve not only the golf course, but the neighborhood as well. We've got an outdoor event space and then indoor restrooms to replace the outdoor restrooms that have actually been on site since 2014. Um, and then we'll do some renovations to the existing building. Most of the renovations we're doing to the existing building are upgrades that need to happen anyway, um, things like roof doors, windows. And the other part of that is to make these two buildings, which sit fairly close to each other, look like at least cousins rather than siblings, um, but just doing what we can to keep that updated. So. Inside this building will be a bar, restaurant, and kitchen. The kitchen is actually intended to serve the golf course, the driving range, the event lawn, and the restaurant all at once. It was sized to do that, and it was also sized um, according with the parking lot. We paid really close attention to what that maximum would look like um, and making sure the kitchen and the parking lot could handle that. Uh, next slide. So this is a quick overview of the timeline. You can see we started in pre-planning, um, which is building that scope of concept planning in 2020, design development through 21, and then 22 has been a lot of permitting and value engineering. So as you know from previous memos, that the escalation price and construction has gone a little bit crazy. So we did everything we could this year to really uh, bring that down into something we could afford. We're currently in the construction, um, so we're just signed um, a construction contract with a company called White Construction, and the, um, I can talk a little bit more about how we contracted them, but they are actually part of a CMGC contract, which means they came in earlier than a construction and they've actually been working with us through that value engineering. So we've actually been going to their sub consultants and they have actually even been giving ideas on material changes and, and anything like that. So. Including the construction that's coming up is a new building, the entire parking lot and driveway replacement, so not just a, an overlay, renovations to the pro shop. And then we're anticipating um, the construction to try to start in the spring of 23. Um, and that's right now, um, we are working on a building permit. So it's in a middle there. We should get comments back fairly soon. Um, and then we'll be able to break around on that one. So next slide. 
So this is really just a view from the golf course. And I just numbered them one through five, just so if we want to come back and reference. I just want to show you guys a couple things. We know this new building is going to pay, take about nine to 12 months to build. Um, and then what we do, we intend to renovate the um, existing pro shop in January and February of 24. That's on the tail end of the project. And the reason we have those dates is really those are the lowest, obviously, like playability. Um, and we want to disrupt play as little as possible, right? Like we want to make sure the revenue generation stays throughout construction as much as possible. There will be some disruptions with the parking lot, but we're going to do our best to just pay attention to that revenue and not impact that piece of it. Our next just slide. Um, so, Can I ask something about that last image? Absolutely. So right now, where those people are standing kind of in the foreground, there, there, I think are practice greens, or there's like a practice facility there where like you can chip up and practice your chipping, whereas like there's a putting green part of the, toward the pro shop. Is that existing green where you can practice chipping and putting going to remain, or is that going to be uh, kind of? It'll, so there are three, there's three small greens around the pro shop. One of those, which will be the one furthest to the west, will be impacted and right. removed. Yeah, and so, so it'll be moved, it won't be taken away, it'll be moved somewhere else. No, you'll just it'll be reduced to two practice oh, rings. Um, what we'll do is we'll sweep that sidewalk out a little bit. Um, and then we'll because what you see here too is where those people are standing. That's actually where the event line would be. So you'd be able to put up one of those large white event tents um, because we're not able to hold big events on the inside, and we want to leave the restaurant available for community and golf use and still be able to hold events. Yeah, I think. That, that person makes a lot of sense to do that. I just wasn't sure what yeah, the point is. Absolutely. Yeah, you can go to the next slide, Rosa, please. Um, so this is just um, the cart staging. And so what this is, the view is if you were, if you're a golfer and you know the facility well, you'd be standing um, at the driving range. Um, and kind of looking in, in the existing buildings, kind of off to the left of this picture. What you'll see is this is the entrance to the bathrooms. And then just to the left of that is that pickup window that I was talking about. And so you can see how the carts are actually kind of um, meant to flow, right? And they're not necessarily crossing traffic. And on that far side is where you're able to stop by on the nine, pick up drinks, refreshments, um, and head back out. One of the things we really talked about is having that quick turn on the nine. It's a revenue generator. Part of it is really just to make it easy, convenient, and keep the play um, moving, and then we get more players on. Okay, next one. Um, so this is just from the parking lot, right? I, we have an accessible entrance. What that car is sort of demonstrating is there's actually going to pick be a drop off lane, a drop off pickup lane. Um, we would do, and it doesn't show on this, but there is improved access from uh, the parking lot as well. There's going to be a crosswalk um, and a curb cut as well. Um, and then there'll be a little bit of lighting. So um, because it is a neighborhood mm -hmm. access, right now it's currently after dark, the whole facility closes. This is something that's going to have the ability to be open for example, in the winter, a little bit after dark. So we have added very minimal lighting in um, the front of the building, in the patio area, and then obviously a little bit in the parking lot just for safety. Um, you can go to the next slide. And this is if you're sitting on the patio, we've been talking about this great flat iron view for a really long time. <laughs> Some of the things, this is a good demonstration of what may have value and sheared out. That's gonna be basically a plain concrete base and where you see sort of the wood um, on the underside of the roof is really just gonna be a little bit more of a, a flat paint. Um, there's things we just had to give up to try to get us closer to where we were um, going to be. But what this should, you can see there's basically like two tables deep in there almost. So it's a pretty deep um, overhang, which should give us a free season dining. One of the other value engineering pieces we had to take out was electric heaters at the roof that are set in. Um, our answer to that is let's wire those. And if we get a vendor in, in time, it's not something that they could add. So it really will extend their use and um, the extent of their dining room. Next slide. So this is pretty just um, this similar. Um, it just shows it kind of moving towards the evening hours. You can see a little bit of fire pit back there. Um, and then just thinking more that it is that neighborhood gathering place in addition to golf. So we just wanted to emphasize that once again. Next. Is that the pro shop in the far right side there? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, really tiny in the back there. <laughs> exactly. 
Next slide. Uh, so this is just the building footprint overall. So I just really wanted to express the red is really the footprint. The blue dashed line is that patio overhang. And then what you say in that in the gray grid pattern is where we have the concrete patio that will come out. Um, and then what you can barely see kind of on the bottom of the screen, there's a really light, dark, light gray outline. Um, that's one potential location for an event tent, but that could move all the way towards the parking lot and anywhere in between. It was more just a demonstration of the size of a tent that could go out there and be moved around based um, on need. Next slide, please. This you've seen before, this is really just what we're doing to the existing. Um, you can see this is a picture of, of the restroom trailer in front that will obviously be going away um, and just some fairly um, minimal impacts on the inside. The one thing that we are doing is because we know point of, like we know uh, brick and mortar sales are reduced and more things are going online. There is an additional office space and we reconfigured things to be ADA accessible on the interior um, in some of the spaces. Tina, may I ask a question? Of course. Because I'll be gone by the time you feel this. Um, do you remember when we were talking about the windows and what we were going to do about the birds, um, you know, that are, that potentially could hit the windows? Have you all decided what you were going to do? Because unfortunately, in the last six months, I've had so many birds die in my house because they hit the windows. Um, I was just wondering if you had addressed that because it was brought up like a year ago. So we have addressed that actually we looked, um, we actually were relying on some National Park Service data and information um, and what their protocol is and one of the recommendations is putting the windows in and then they actually have a process of tracking. So let's decide how much of an issue it is, where the issue is, and then there are some aftermarket treatments that we can put on there that would be sort of a grid pattern. So more so, um, I think in the new building, um, having that grid pattern, right? Like will change the way it is looking out, but it's also the cost and the expense of the value engineering piece. So yeah. if, we, if we track and we pay attention and we see where there's an issue, we can put a treatment on the, the sides or the windows that are having the issue. So we do have a product kind of looked at what we could add and it's a fairly minimal expense um, if you're just adding it to a couple of windows that are your know, problems. Oh, that's wonderful. May I call you offline about that too? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. I have a question about the main building, the restaurant. So is when people are playing golf and they want to go get something for lunch, either rounding nine or just they're done with their round, whatever, that's a different restaurant than the community restaurant or is it the same restaurant that's serving the golfers and the community? It's the same. Okay. So there should, there's a pickup window on the outside. So the someone coming around on their nine would have two options. Depending on the vendor, I would venture to guess if you write the, get the right vendor in there, you're online placing your order, and then you're stopping by the pickup window, grabbing it, and being able to use the restroom and go. Um, so the way we've actually configured the restaurant, too, is there's a, a clear path between like the kitchen and the bar area, which has the open window or the pickup window. Okay. And my next question, I think you answered, but we're going to get a vendor in there as opposed to running it ourselves. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And you'll get an update from Stephanie um, on that, I think, in the next couple of months, probably March or April. It's on the calendar. Stephanie and I are already starting to work on it. Okay. So, absolutely. And we definitely envision it serving the entire community, not just the, the neighborhood, but um, it can be a, a really fun place for people to come and hang out and just a, a great location year round. So, that's the whole. Right. And there will be a liquor license as well. So we've got to go through that process as well. Yes. Okay. Do we anticipate that being approved and done when we open? Or is that something that we anticipate like will be kind of trailing the finished construction? That would be a good question. It will be approved. <laughs> the, the intention is, is that when the building is done, we have a signed and approved lease with a vendor who has an approved liquor license. So they fully open and begin at the very beginning. And so we've actually started last summer working with the Colorado group. We learned through our experience with Boulder Reservoir that we are not experts in restaurant operations. And while we've learned a ton, we brought in experts to help us with finding great people, developing a lease that would reflect leading practices in private partnerships. And they're actually part of their fee is to help us find someone great. 
So we're pretty, pretty excited about it. Um, yeah. Can I ask a follow up on that? So I, I would assume that as part of the liquor licensing process, we're going to ensure that the uh, proposal is that this is a um, neighborhood wide, like citywide facility. A regional so facility. Not, this is a regional facility. This is not just a restaurant and bar for like the houses that are around the golf course. Correct. Okay. Which I know was a barrier to the reservoir restaurant liquor process. Correct. Okay. I'll also point out another distinction here is that there has been an existing liquor license here for decades. Okay. Um, Tom, the director of golf and his team have been bringing the neighbors along, um, again, learning from the reservoir experience where we heard from folks where they felt like this was a surprise. We have, um, I would I would say we're trying to err on the side of over communication to keep people in the loop. Tina and operations are working hand in glove to keep up communications, to keep clear on what we're trying to deliver so that we don't hear folks saying, wait, a restaurant? Um, so I think they're all doing a really great job and we're going to try and deliver something great for the community. Yeah, next slide. And this is just a quick overview of the parking lot again, what we talked about before. So the configuration of striping is the same direction it was before. Um, there's permitting reasons for that to leave the striping the same direction. Um, however, we did add the vegetation islands, which you each see on each end of those rows. And what we're talking about is a hidden a little bit, but sort of the top right is where um, our accessible parking is. So we've got an EV station there. And we have a second EV station that we don't need to do, do per code, but we feel like this is a really good location and, and high potential use. Um, and then what we're doing is leaving those islands for potential future EV stations. Something else we've also looked at is if you look at the, the islands that are on the, it's east side, but the top of the page. If we put an EV station in there with two ports, it actually will service three to four parking spots. So we're also trying to expand that as well as the use of those. Um, because we know, right, like when you put the EV stations right in front, <laughs> there can be some conflict. So we're trying to eliminate some of that as well. And will, will the um, parking spots in the center, uh, are they going to be uh, wired up for future EV access or will it just be on the islands? The island, just the islands right now, but there's a fair amount of islands. Um, and as like you were saying, like I was saying, those EV stations with two port could actually facilitate three spaces. So sure. Um, technology is always improving, so we'll keep watching on that. Um, and we were just, we have to keep, you know, you have to have so much space for an EV station with a concrete base and the whole works. Um, so if we were to put them in the middle of islands, uh, we would lose the parking spaces and we wouldn't have sort of the right amount for the high use times. The other thing I would add is that to build on the point about technology, I'll cha always change it. I just saw something last week for off-grid charging stations that are that are fueled by an overhead solar umbrella. And so I, I suspect we're going to continue to see advancements in this. We see that the electric car market is, is surging and that the charging has to keep up and it's so expensive um, and comes at a cost. So I, I think I, I would predict that if we were to talk about trends and, and design that we're going to continue to see charging improvements because people are seeing that gap all over the country. And just that clarity of like sleeving, basically we're running a conduit, plastic conduit out to each one of those islands. So if technology as it changes too, there's multiple things that could happen within that without having to tear the right. part back up. I just wonder if it would make sense to run conduit along the center line of each of those parking stripes with that utility access covers on top of it so that any one of those parking spots could potentially have a um, have an EV charging port at some point in the future. So there was a little bit of a discussion, but in the value of engineering is it worth right now that possibility, right? You're spending, I think it was, I think it came at like $15,000 to do the first three rows. Wow. Um, and I'll do it for less than that. <laughs> <laughs> on, the, on the alt modes, um, I don't know, EVs classify as alt modes, but the other thing I guess I just wanted to call out and, and connect dots from a previous conversation that it is currently that frontage on Arapahoe is a gap in the transportation from a multi-use path, and it's one that we flag every single time um, and try and find. And as we, we do see infrastructure funding, I've got it on my wish list for things of... 
conversation this morning, but on the north side. Of the road. On the north side of the road. And so then it's the safe crossing. Yeah. My other dream is that we just build a tunnel that get people from the Centennial Trail on the south side of the golf course to the clubhouse. So I've asked Scott to investigate that if we could just build a tunnel, <laughs> a tunnel, a golf tunnel. Typical. You know how it, when our a tunnel, the safe <laughs> tunnel, we need that to get people across the golf course to the restaurant on, from the south side or a wildlife bridge. You know, there is oh, there has got to be something. <laughs> um, you can go to the next slide. That was kind of the end of my presentation. I have a question. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. You're muted. Oh, I remuted. Um, so a couple of questions. If we are going to do that channel or whatever, <laughs> should be rounded so that you know when we were kids we used to whatever camp out in the uh tunnels of the highway that was being built near my house and stuff so uh, rounded edges is one yeah. <laughs> mary i would i should clarify that i'm being facetious building a tunnel for pedestrian transportation is highly ineffective cost cost um, oh. there, there are other ways to get people to the center of the golf course that'll be more cost effective we'll figure it out Okay, I didn't know that yeah. was because yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I shouldn't be sarcastic in more meetings. <laughs> well, I thought it sounded fun. But um, it, 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 it is fun. We are getting years, less bike parking. <laughs> a couple of years ago we talked about drive in movies and I wanted yes. to make sure that was still in the uh plan. Thanks. Yeah, I'll speak for the operations team and that that the motto that they have adopted at Flatirons is a place where everyone feels welcome. And it's not just that they want everyone, even the, as Tom would say, the non-golfy people feel welcome, but that even if you're not playing golf, right? I mean, I don't know about you. When I saw those pictures of the back lawn, cornhole and ladder and whatever lawn game you want to play, they uh, the performances by the orchestra, Scott could answer this too, right? But I just know what they've been building in the last three years with performances by the various music groups, the, the drive-ins that... We want this golf course to be a place for everyone. It's why we are spending so much money on it. And I can't tell if the grassy area, if people who didn't drive or wanted to bike, could they put a blanket for movie night? Is I don't know, where would the screen be? Yeah, absolutely. There's there's gonna be quite a bit of space out there. Um, you saw the the footprint in gray for the, the large event tent, but there's quite a bit of additional space. So we would probably look at doing an inflatable screen and. Um, really a, a nice setup where we can envision uh, a lot of places where, where people could just bring their lawn chairs or, or sit on blankets. Yeah, and the parking lot on the sort of east, let's see if I, so on the, yeah, the, I guess it'd be the west side of the property. So if you think of the new building on the west side of the property, the event lawn does, um, is adjacent to the parking lot. So there are ways we could configure that. And I think the question really would be is, are people craving, um, right, sitting in their car, or they're going to crave sitting on the blanket or a combination of, and there are opportunities for both. Yeah. Um, as a non-golfy person, this is really exciting. I've never slept <laughs> but on the golf course, so I'm very excited to, to bring my family there. Um, but given that, I just want to um, urge you to make those parking spaces big enough to bigger than Scott Harbinger so that you can actually get kids in and out of your car and open the door because it is impossible in, some, in so many instances to park at Scott Carpenter and get out of your car or you come, up, come back and you can't get it back in your car. So there's a secret. So those are mostly compact parking spaces. What you'll notice and you can't really tell from the drawing is every other parking row is compact and the other is a standard parking space. So we kind of varied that to fit as many as we can in, but also, right, like people have golf bags and children. Right. Yes. Right. And then there will also be a restriped crosswalk all the way through the parking lot as well. I saw Stephanie, who's our regional facilities manager, turned on her camera. Stephanie, if you wanted to add to this, please do. You're muted, friend. No, not at all. I'm listening and uh, you guys are doing a great job covering it. Uh, the only thing that I popped on camera on was the movie um, so, and you all answered it. So nicely done. Thank you. That's something we have to get better at is remembering we, we have really bright teammates in the room and on the computer. So sorry we missed that the first time, Stephanie. And I, I, I do want to add too that I, I think um, in looking at Stephanie and Tom's vision for kind of the overall operation, 
operations at the golf course. The hope would be whoever comes in to operate the restaurant is running, you know, weekday specials where you can come out with your little ones. We can get them a putter in the pro shop. They can be on the putting green and, and, um, you know, parents can sit and, and eat a nice meal and enjoy the indoor outdoor space, the tremendous view and, and really it's just open whether you're golfing or not. Um, and so if we find the right uh, company to, to run that restaurant, we're really confident. It's going to be a popular location um, where it's, it's really going to see a lot of use to be extremely successful because there's not much else in the area. Yeah. So great. And it's fun to think of like, I don't know if it's miniature golf or cutting green or how different those two things are, but it's a fun concept. <laughs> yep. There's lots of, yeah, lots of ideas of little games we can play to just to get people interested. Um, and then what you, I didn't really describe on there too is so the dining room actually has a large garage door that opens up. Well, it's not a garage door. It's actually a, <laughs> um, it's a door. It's, it's yeah. <laughs> so it's right. Like it's large. Oak, so it's definitely that indoor outdoor feeling. It's kind of almost that sort of like just slightly upscale right back feel, right? Like there's fun stuff with you outside. There's a fire pit. It's coming. In. It's awesome. Well, this is very exciting. Yeah, and I meant when introducing this item to share that both with this item and the next item, it's it's more informational because we're put, well with golf course, we're giving you an update. You gave lots of information along the way. Um, but you know, the action plan and this next conversation at the civic area, we're poising you for future conversations. So heavy on us talking tonight, but setting the stage for more board engagement in the coming year. And I hope we can renew site visits in the near future. That would be yes. lovely. Yeah, we would love that. I don't know if we're going to do a groundbreaking ceremony, but. So what we probably will do, um, we're planning that out right now because I want to do, I want to get folks out there and excited while we're on our construction as well. So we talked about a couple of things, uh, even before construction, staking corners of the building, for example, and potentially having uh, the neighbors of Crab out for um, a small barbecue um, to just kind of review the site and talk about it. It feels different sometimes when you're standing on site too. So people are like, oh, that's what that is. And that's where that is. Um, so we haven't decided what all the logistics of that are exactly yet, but that's that's the plan and the intention. And you'll see banners going up on the construction fence um, is what it's going to look like from each side. That's why you'll see these renderings are from each side, so we can put a banner on each side of those construction fencing as well. It's actually you know, great, I don't. I'm just one moment. Martin was going to chime in with one. I know it. it's like, it's a good segue. Thanks, Tina. It's, it's Tina. It's your NPO service, isn't it? Really? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. My tenth full time. So I just <laughs> I'm going to be six months, but the golf course is one of the really tricky projects at the minute. The citywide, we've seen cost escalation go through the roof. We've seen the ability to hire contractors become really difficult. And Tina did a fantastic job using the method you described to basically rein in costs and keep the quality of the project and find new ways to actually think about the design that kept the quality but saved costs. So I just want to. Thank you. You get a chance to do that in person. That I know it's <laughs> lovely. Um, if there are no more questions on that item, I'm going to give a 10 second pause and continue with matters from the department. Thank you. Well, are we going to aren't we going to go on to the civic after after the pause? No. Yep, there's one more one more matter from the department. So uh, I'll let Mark actually. I'll let you introduce this item and she home. Civic area. Yes. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> just just check out here. Yeah, yeah. Good point. So um, yeah, half the planning team now is new, so it's probably worth just mentioning a few of us characters uh, that are existing and have come <laughs> on board. So yeah, as you know, I jumped on board in July as the new planning manager as part of Ali's reorg. So make that more centralized and focused. And within that team now, we've got uh, obviously Tina, senior planner, and we've brought on two senior landscape architects. Tonight, Shahobi's with us. Uh, you'll meet Erin Wagner soon. She's going to be working, for instance, on Violet Park, so you'll be hearing about that. And then we also have Charlotte, who has come on board as our planner now. She used to work directly for Ali prior to that. And then Tina was recently a uh, replacement for our cultural resources historic assets. So when you see the hip report, you'll get to meet David. And then on the other end of things, we've got a, our construction team, and that's stayed the same folk. We're just looking at how we can revamp that and integrate that with all the new people on board. So we're very excited. It's a new team. And as Ali's pointed out, we've got a lot of planes coming out the hangars, moving onto the runway. 
So that's what you're seeing with these informs. As they lift off, you'll get more engaged in the projects. With that, I'll just show me we're working on now on plan phase 1B of the civic area. Yeah. Uh, I'll just mention Shahobi's come to us from Design Workshop, uh, landscape architecture planning firm, great background. They've actually worked with the city on a number of projects, so you've got some familiarity. And we're very excited for Shahobi to work on these projects because she's got that technical design background along with the planning background. And with that, I'll pass it over. Thanks, Mark. And I, I'll say thank you so much. Um, I met some of you before today, and hello to um, all that I haven't met in person yet. Hopefully, eventually we will meet. I'm excited to be part of the team, the department, and the city. It's really great to work with such an innovative everyone here yeah. in Boulder. So um, I'll go ahead and do the civic area presentation and basically kicking off next phases. So I know it's been a long road. Um, we have quite a few more phases to do, a lot to do. So um, why don't you go to the next slide? Just the arrows down below your screen there. You scroll down and hover at the bottom of the screen. I think you'll see some arrows. You can just arrow down now that you've got it open. There you go. Uh -huh. oh, Why don't you move the, Rosa, if you drag the people to the left side of the screen, I think you'll see a little bit more of the navigation. Nope. It might just be blown up a little bit. You might need to stretch yeah, it out. Yeah, I can then you there that way. It's also yeah. like mouse and point. <laughs> Is there a way to get you on camera? We'll have you... Yeah. See, so people will pop up as they talk. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Um, so for this agenda, um, I know it looks long. I'll try to keep it simple and concise, but we'll talk about some of the next phases, what we've done, what we're looking for in the future. Um, and then the planning context where we have been phase 1A, what's completed basically. Mark alluded to phase 1B, so that's the initial project scope and schedule we'll be working on for the next couple of years. Um, and then crab involvement, next steps that you all can look forward to and key questions. So, um, still coming. here we go. So in the civic area, um, phases, I just wanted to point out, so our 2015 civic area plan, we had um, a lot of great planning work done for this whole area, uh, civic park, central park area downtown, it included Pearl Street and Arboretum updates. Um, so what we had to do was sort of kind of chop that up right into multiple phases to actually get final implementation done. So just wanted to call your attention to that phase one, basically the improvements between the library and the municipal building. So all of that constructed now um, is what I'll be calling phase one tonight. Um, phase one B is actually just, we wanted to acknowledge that Central Park is included in phase one B and that was really meant to be constructed in phase one A um, because of budget constraints, we just couldn't get there. So it's just an acknowledgement that phase one as a total has split into two separate phases if that makes sense. As we go through this, um, just keep in mind a couple of questions. So um, clarity on the scope of work for next phase, that 1B, um, and then actually any issues that we should be focused on for community engagement. That'll be some of our next steps. And so we just wanted to highlight those two things as we go through the presentation, just keep top of mind for questions and I'll get to those at the end of this presentation. So where we have been, I thought it would be a good idea just to recap, right? It's been several years. We've had a pandemic. We've had market shifts. So um, just 2012, Boulder kicked off the civic area planning effort. 2013, uh, we had a vision plan adopted by council, and that really included um, overall nine guiding principles. We moved into a civic area plan in 2015, and really what that did was take those principles and marry it with um, this concept. 
conceptual plan. So we got the overall vision and then we got sort of the diagram of concept married together, if that makes sense. Um, and that, that really included, like I mentioned, Civic Park, Central Park, an east and a west bookend. Um, the diagram really didn't include a con uh, conceptual plan for connection up to Pearl Street and the Pearl Street enhancements itself, but it definitely outlined that in the original planning effort, as well as the Arboretum connection and design. So that's all inclusive um, of this planning effort. And then just a reminder of all the robust public engagement, stakeholder engagement, CRAB, council, many advisory boards, um, is included in the last several years, then we'll continue to go forward with that type of robust engagement in phase 1B. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the guiding principles. I just have them up on the screen here. These are the nine that I talked about before, and I just wanted to call attention to the importance of them and how we really guided design through these nine principles um, in phase 1A. We'll definitely be carrying this forward in phase 1B. This is what we all sort of agreed on in the community as priority and with the city and BPR. Um, so for phase 1B, this will definitely be carried forward in the next um, planning and phase of design. Phase 1A completed. So I thought I would just mention um, what's out there today and what we got accomplished. We got accomplished quite a bit for um, the budget, right? And they're very beautiful improvements and I think very dynamic and engaging. Um, so really opening up the space with event lawn, that multi-use lawn, um, really wonderful native gardens um, and some uh, new enhancements to hardscape and plazas. We did a great work on the new player area, which is more of, of a natural play and water play next to the library. Um, if you can remember the creek cleanup and restoration that took place, um, we definitely worked hard to enhance and create views, um, clean up the creek and making it more healthy. Um, there was a lot of work done and that also included these wonderful nodes down to the creek. So more access, more views, more engagement. And with that too, we did um, a bit of an upgrade on some existing historical seating areas next to the creek. And then sort of the thing that ties everything together is the multimodal pass. We did a lot of work on uh, the bike path that will eventually connect to the Boulder Creek area. So giving it a fresher update, I believe we even included a little bit of striping and enhancement on that, as well as that um, spine up 11th Street. So connecting that pedestrian um, enhancement from each side of the park across the creek. So we got, we got quite a bit done. And just, you know, because uh, sometimes spatially it's better to look at plan view. So this is really in phase 1A completed from the library to the municipal building, including that creek restoration, our pedestrian connections, both east and west, um, the event lawn that we sort of opened up, and um, plaza and library enhancements. So. Okay, so what we can look forward to and what we're just, as Mark mentioned, getting kind of the plane situated and we're coming out of the plane hangar. Um, task one, the scope of project and management plan. Um, developing a project charter with the scope of work. So really defining that boundary, right? Like I said, um, phase 1A and 1B, uh, really we were supposed to include Central Park into the construction of one, phase one, um, but since we didn't, we can take a more holistic look. So we can step back and we can say, okay, really what does phase one be? What should that include? And that's what we'll be working on in terms of um, thinking about a project boundary, um, doing a project management plan around that boundary um, and developing a community engagement plan. So we're really gonna look at a pretty big area and then probably really dial it in eventually when we get down to design. We're going to also start um, a historic district um, in this area as well, and we'll be back in Q2 to just give an update on that. That is also starting in the planning phase right now, so early days on that. We're going to work, uh, work hand in hand with um, planning and development services with that historic district. Task two, pre-planning. Um, we're going to have all these bullet points, gap analysis, activity and space activation, precedent study. Really, if you think about this, this is going to be analysis 
Um, so the key thing here that we would like to work on is um, guiding analysis for phase 1B. This is a lot of area to cover. We know we need gaps to fill in for that analysis on site. Um, also, we have this newly constructed book in phase 1A. How is it being utilized? What's working? What's not? Um, you know, multiple questions there to survey and ask and gain feedback on something that we've already built. And I'll remind us too, again, there's been so much done since 2018 when this implementation went in. Um, market could have shifted too to what people expect and want from parks, what kind of program they want to see, how they want to utilize different amenities. Um, so all of that can go into our pre-planning work and those two tasks will sort of go hand in hand in 2023. Um, schematic design. So this is where I talk about getting deeper into that level where we're starting to draw a boundary. Um, hopefully we will, if I go back a couple slides, um, we will start to have drawings, an illustrative drawing similar to this that encompasses um, east of Broadway. Again, not really knowing exactly the boundary yet, um, but we're really drilling down into a site-specific project. We're going to still do some of the um, analysis with a feasibility study and market area study. Again, kind of figuring out if any perception or needs of um, the public or retail has shifted since then and how to incorporate all of that into a beautifully integrated park design. Um, along with that, uh, I know Ali and Tina and Mark all mentioned kind of costs and um, really inflation and really having to work with, for instance, the golf course. So um, what will be key during this phase as well would be um, not only the design, but pairing that with consistent cost analysis, right? Um, so as the market kind of has swung into major inflation and maybe our market will be slowing down and some things will be softening, we'll really try and keep cost tracking um, at schematic, but also at design documentation and CD drawings. I probably should have spelled those two out. I did DD and CDs, but... Um, those will, as we dive down into the detail, we'll marry that with cost and we'll get a better idea of final implementation and construction. And task five, hopefully we're kicking off um, construction by 2025. Um, and at the same time, task six and seven, we'll be working on some plans to sort of marry up with a park, really looking at the maintenance standards and practices and space activation plan. Um, so those will kind of dovetail together at the same around the same time as task five. So as I went through all those bullet points, I touched on some of that timing, um, but this is just a graphic so you can see really where we're at for this year. It's that scoping and planning work. Um, so really doing our homework on what was already built, what kind of gaps do we have in our current study or thinking and analysis of the site. Um, we'll get into the schematic design. We'll start to um, kick that off at the end of 2023, but really get going in 2024. Design development, that's that detailing and um, final cost analysis will be 2025 and hopefully kicking off construction. And then that overlap of those two plants that will sort of over, start to overlay the two phases of the park. So um, crab involvement, I just wanted to let you all know that um, major activities for collaboration um, will definitely be around the programming of phase 1B as we kind of look at scoping and finalize boundary, um, as well as the final, um, the, the final schematic design will be looking for recommendations um, and collaborating with Prab on that. And just a note, you know, reminder on Prab roles and responsibilities, you can look to um, the PRAB organization and functions document um, from the uh, deputy city attorney office. And the other note too, um, as we go through involvement, we will be uh, guided by the city engagement spectrum table from Boulder's engagement strategic framework. So this document here is really just talking to um, how we engage, how often we engage, when we engage, right? And so PRAB can look forward to um, when we inform and we'll inform um, from task one to seven all the way up, um, all the way through those tasks as we progress. Um, we'll involve PREB in study sessions on site programming and space activation, and we'll consult um, updated items to review a draft schematic design and multiple alternatives. Um, and then finally, collaborating on action items to review the final schematic design plan. 
Do you help me? Can I have an ask on this slide? Yeah. When you talk both above um, at, about collaborating activities and programming alternatives and then consulting our, sorry, involving on-site program and space activation, yes. will you clarify those terms from a landscape architect perspective? Because what I think goes to a lot of people's heads is recreation programming and activities, and that's not what we're talking about. So I wonder if you could clarify that. I think that would be helpful. On the, I'm sorry, on the programming? When you talk about site programming and site activities, you're not talking about aquatics and gymnastics. And yes, that's yes, that's a good question. Um, so when I say programming, I'm really talking about um, where play activities will occur, where flexible events will occur, where we want connections and multimodal connections. Um, so really outdoor activity spaces. And some of those will be tied into physical attributes like play structures and things like that. So it's space design, space not, design. not it, that that same thing happens in vertical mm -hmm. architecture. They talk about space programming and thank you for that. Make sure we're all on the same in, in the same park. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> Can I ask a question about it, it's related to this slide, I suppose, but in terms of thinking about community engagement, um, what other city uh, departments and groups have to review this before it gets? That's a great question, Elliot, and it brings me to my next steps. Um, so in Q2, uh, what we're going to be really updating you all on is. Um, I'll just jump down here. This should see this should actually say community and stakeholder engagement plan. So right now, currently, we're going through a plan to sort of decipher, okay, core team of the civic area. Um, we have sort of that team built. And then really we need to decide advisory boards from there. Um, we'll definitely obviously include PRAB. We'll be looking to council as well. Um, the planning board is going to be involved. Um, did I miss any? I was accepting the plan from the department. Perspective, uh, we talked about uh, planning and design services, transport, utilities, and um, housing and human services. In some ways, it's easier to list the departments that won't be involved. Yeah, right, but, uh, right. Yeah. It, it, we just had the first sort of internal molten call team meeting on Friday to start talking through. I'm going to add a few because I do think that's an important question. And it also speaks to how. Um, grateful we are to have a skilled planner like Shihomi to manage the, the various threads that are going to need to come together on this project. So the Arts Commission will provide input on public art and refinement of strategies related to arts. The Boulder, this is all spelled out in the Civic Area Master Plan. The Boulder Design Advisory Board has input on urban design for any new buildings or major changes to existing buildings. That's not, not necessarily to relevant it's part 1B as it relates to park at the core, but the East Bookend has some critical city facilities and potential as people talk about performing arts conflict. The Downtown Management um, Commission should be consulting on um, connectivity and relationship with the downtown, the commercial area, general improvement district. Um, the Human Relations Commission could be consulted for advice on fostering inclusiveness, particularly as it relates to our homeless population. The Landmarks Board will be consulted on this. I think you mentioned them, where there's an interest in a historic district. The Library Commission could be consulted for changes to the library and input on anything adjacent to the library. Probably not likely for this phase of the project because we're talking about the east side of the park. Um, you mentioned Planning Board and TAB. RAP, the Water Resources Advisory Board, could be consulted on creek improvements and any proposed flood mitigation. So to, to, to Mark's point, there are 20 boarding commissions. I think maybe there's four that we won't be considering. You ask, people will say, why does it take so stinking long? This is a complicated project. It's, you talk about projects that impact cities. This is one. It's five years from now, we're going to walk in this park and we're going to talk about what an incredible space it is. And we're going to be grateful that we are thoughtful in getting there. But we, the, the people. You all will be hearing about it a lot. Yeah, well, but your department will manage the space. Yes. So whatever is constructed will be managed. Just, just to clarify, like, uh, we've got planning and design services have, like, a key oversight and help to collaborate on the largest of the area. And then what they'll be working sort of hand in hand with Shihomi because we have these specific spaces, like the Arboretum Park, Central Park, et cetera, that will be parks basically designed. I think there might be a clarification, though, that Parks will be taking care of all of that 1B because that includes like Pomoka, the tea house, the atrium, right? And so those, right, I think UPR has a part in it, but all those other divisions also have a big part to play. So this is this might be a little bit in the weeds, but in terms of managing property, is parks responsible for the entirety of the creek? Or is there like, is it just the banks of the creek? 
Okay. Here, 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 here. Come on. You, you, you so another, it, there are issues of water and property law in yes. Colorado that are specific. Oh my goodness. Yes. And I'm just wondering, like, whether that's something that's that the low surface, low surface, high water line, low water line floodplain, and everyone has a different stake in it as you get into the management of it. And we've actually, luckily, that will be part of the big analysis instead. And here's the other thing I would add is that, I mean, we actually, Joe Tadayuchi is the director of utilities, and he was just offering the, the way our departments work together for the creek, for the reservoir, it's exemplary of how agencies should coordinate and partner together. So if there is a piano in the middle of the creek, our team doesn't say, go get it, utilities, right? Like there is a very strong partnership between utilities and transportation and parks and recreation for the entire length of the Boulder Creek Path. And so our team does the day-to-day -day operations of the Creek Path. We do minor maintenance. If it gets within a certain distance in proximity to the creek, we will absolutely consult with utilities because not only because of the um, the water, but there's also there's a really rich riparian corridor that's really... It, it, it takes a lot of partnership and the line is is very, very gray, but I think in a good way. Well, I guess it's as gray as you want it to be. It could be pretty black and white and it is. Colorado water law is complex and it's, um, so we consult with utilities a lot. If you think of like the Ever Pearson kids fishing pond, we have to be very, very careful about managing how much water goes into that pond because it does take away from, um, it has to be calculated in the city's water, 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 um, there's a word that's escaping me. Budget. Yeah. Sure. It's it's not water budget. It's our allocation. It's our ownership of water out of the Take creek. Feet. Yeah. But I, I think from what we saw from 1A, this, that's where that collaboration comes through because of the types of spaces that were created. And I think we have a few slides to finish up just before we get the question. Um, yeah, I, just along with that community engagement and stakeholder engagement, um, we will have that. Uh, to preview in Q2, we'll have sort of the first pass of scope of work, we'll update our charter, um, and then we'll have more to share um, with the partnership on the planning and development services. Um, they're working through the historic district creation and timeline, so they'll be um, sharing that as well in Q2. And this is perfect timing for <laughs> questions. <laughs> um, a question, I honestly haven't well thought enough through, so we'll see how it goes, but um, it's incredible how complicated this problem is, you know, and some of those things are predictable. The human element, I feel like, is less predictable, and I'm just wondering, you know, knowing how much energy and, and resources were put into 1A, which looks amazing, but the usage, I think, has been really severely impacted by the human element. And I'm just wondering what what, what have you learned from that that is going into the planning of 1B? So, and when you say the human element, um, is it, can you speak a little bit more? Sure. Like the, the, the people who are living there, who are, you know, closing down our libraries because of meth and things like that. So it's just, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to create a space for the community and that park at the library is amazing. But as a parent, I know a lot of people don't go there anymore. They don't use it anymore because of dangers posed by the people who are living in that area. So I'm just curious, you know, what, what have you learned from that situation that is going into the planning and management of, of the next phase? And I don't have, I, I, it's so complex, I don't even really know how to ask that question. So I, what I would say is it really goes into a couple of things. One of them would be, um, I'll go back to that word, um, programming again and thinking about how we're really programming space mm -hmm. um, and knowing that we're going to be doing the work to really uh, study how people are engaging in in the park that's out there today in 1A, um, really gleaning some good information from there. But also, um, Ali, what was the name of the plan, the engagement plan? Coexistence. The what? The coexistence. The coexistence. Yes, thank you. Um, the coexistent plan that we have um, that can guide us in helping working with multiple um, user groups and people found around the city who also um, need access to multiple amenities, but in a safe way, right? So we do have that plan that we'll incorporate in and work closely with that um, sort of at the same time of one being. 
And that she hung me. So do you want to just go back to the schedule? Second, because I think this will help. This is the, it's it's a main topic of conversation. How do we make the spaces successful for everyone in the community? Yeah. And the plan looks amazing. Right. But then you see see something, something new which you wouldn't have typically seen before. The design plan is the uh, the dark blue, the two last uh, rows. And those two rows are saying while we're moving through design and construction, typically you do design construction, you walk away and then people come in like uh, social workers, volunteers, junior rangers would be there, like an open space, that activate space, youth programs. But that all happens after the park's constructed and the scissors have been sort of cutting the ribbon. So our goal here is to bring in the blue, it seems like the operations side of it. How do we support that space? Like, so people are looking at the design, not the construction piece. And then in the blue, it's like, that is that activation. What does it look like for these spaces to be successful? So it won't happen at the rim cut and it won't be happening like a year before. And then we're planning on hopefully being able to uh, use sort of the funding to look at the space for three years and actually make adjustments as needed. So that's, it's, there's no perfect solution to this, and Ali will point to that. But at least in this mode process, we're tying design to the use of the space, I think more closely with it. That was both of you answered that perfectly. I do want to I want to add something about the phase 1A and the use of the park. So when that park was completed, we had great hopes and dreams for activation and concerts and vendors. And um we, we were on a really good trajectory of that until 2020. So if you look at our position reductions and our funding reductions, we took away funding for events that couldn't happen, right? So it's not like we defunded activities that were happening in Central Park. There's a, um, one of the godfathers of, of, of you know parks planning who was a commissioner with New York Parks and Recreation and then worked for the Trust for Public Land. He, he said something at a session I was at once that I just, we live by with this, is that a multiplicity of positive uses is the best response to negative uses. And we've not been able to do that in civic area phase one due to the pandemic. And Allie, so we- Allie, can you repeat that? I didn't, I didn't hear that. A multiplicity of positive uses is the best response to negative uses. Got it. Thank you. And so when we talk about how we design the space, how we use the space, we want to see, Shihomi had lovely pictures of the park and people in it on a vibrant market Saturday. We want that happening seven days a week, right? We want that fostering. If, if people are living and working downtown, we want them in the park all day, every day. And, and we need to build that. So, um, in addition to with this second phase of the park, we have to revisit the work with the first phase of the park and how are we funding and setting it up for ongoing. I'll mention, you said earlier, your department's gonna manage the park. Yes, and my dream is that in four years, we have a strong partnership of people that are operating this park. You look at great downtown civic spaces, they are not operated by the city alone. There is a partnership. There are many, many people, including nonprofits that are operating the space. Um, Pearl Street is a micro example of that because it takes the partnership of the downtown Boulder um, partnership to make that space work. They pick up where the city can in not only operations and maintenance, but in the programming that they do. So um, you name an activity that happens on the Pearl Street Mall, we don't make it happen. I, I joke with Chip all the time, we get great credit for it and I welcome that. We do the tulip giveaway. Right, but the concerts, the the um, festivals that happen on the mall, that's the downtown Boulder partnership. So my hope is that in tandem with this project, we design a backbone and an infrastructure that helps make sure that this park, if, if Pearl Street's the heart and, and the civic area is the soul, it is constantly looking like these pictures. We don't have, I want to be, we don't have the answer right now. She homie mentioned a resource that we started to use with the master plan where we talked about space values and including with members of the homeless community. We're going to continue this that conversation in this planning process. And we're going to talk to people about behaviors. The intent is to destigmatize the members of the unhoused community and others and just talk with people about behaviors that are okay and not in public spaces. Those are the pictures. Thank you for bringing that up again. Yes. That's right. Like yes, this, thank is, you. this is cool. So it was a great presentation. Um, could, could you please go to the plan view that sort of shows connection to Cross Canyon? Yes. Uh, keep going. The full plan? Yeah. I guess that, that's good right there. 
So there you're showing connections up to the Arboretum. So, so defining the scope of this is going to be really tough, right? Because yes. you've got city-owned property, you've got some privately-owned property there to the south of the uh, Bold Museum Contemporary Art on 13th Street. Um, and you're showing these important connections that go across Canyon, linking up to the downtown at the Pearl Street Mall. And these equally important connections that are going to go south to hook up to CU, the Hill, the new hotel conference center that's there, the Arboretum, which is in a just really distress, distressful condition. Um, there are missing connections that you're not showing to, into the Goss Grove neighborhood across 14th Street. Mm. Um, past the Duchamp Bay Tea House, there's a multi-use path that goes and it just ends on 14th. 14th is going to be occupied by a new bus terminal soon. So RTD will be parking buses along there and having stops there. So um, those connections to the east are just as important as the ones to the north and south. So I don't envy you with defining the scope of this. Yeah, I can't give you any advice, but I wish you a lot of luck. <laughs> <laughs> and we do have, um, do we have a actually the transportation about the 14th street you just discussed it yeah there's a meeting this morning there's a lot of my city meeting but no joking and that's what Joe was finding out this is a big problem at the moment what we do want to do is is like the 2015 plan gives us great guidance that says you know phase one phase two phase three it's been many years eight years since that was developed so that's Joe's point the blue blog we're going to look at you know it's not a defined boundary yet We'll be able to then say, let's do schematic design. And we might come back and be like, this is how much we can do for phase 1B. But we'll point to phase 2 and phase 3 with clearer cost estimating, which then will allow us to then fund those projects and get them in sequence. So it keeps the whole thing moving forward. And, and as we get into this, there might be simple reasons like, oh, we need to do the arboretum path now because he used developing the conference center. And there's a way to fund that. Meanwhile, we might be looking to the north of here saying, well, let's hold off on those connections because then it was urgent, or it's simply a matter of cost, which ones do we have to prioritize? So that's the important decision we'll be making in about a year's time. Better. And thanks for saying good luck. Yeah. <laughs> I have to chime in. It's, it's, it, certainly you want things to go your way, but man with the brains around the table, I feel like the thoughtfulness, they, they, they bring me these and I'm like, two years? Why is it going to take? Oh, this is why it's going to take so long because they're going to thoughtfully, right? If we're going to, if we're, there's so many different metaphors you can use, right? But we're, we're going to knit a beautiful civic area scarf and they're making sure we have all the threads, first of all, in the same room, right? Before we start knitting, do we all agree on the pattern? Uh, and, and I'm really grateful for the thoughtfulness with which they're stewarding this plan. Yeah, it's, it's a super important crossroads from a transportation point of view. Mm -hmm. as a bicycle commuter, right? So you've got the creek path running there east-west. You've got the, the um, boulder multi-use path coming down past the ball, the ball fields by the high school, crossing 13th, going down 13th, crossing onto uh, 13th, going toward the Pearl Street Mall. So it's, it's a super dynamic and important area that you've got to get right. So. Exciting. Thank you. Anyone else online? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Shelly. Inaugural presentation for the Thank you. Scotty and Shihomi, you made it. <laughs> and then that wraps up matters from the department for tonight. Great. And I'm I'm very sorry to do this, but I need to go. And I've talked to Ali and Rosa before, but I'm going to pass the meeting off to Chuck right now. Um, I most of you know that I commute and I work in California. My city that I grew up in, Monterey Park, had a massacre this weekend. It's my city. I grew up in it, Monterey Park and Alhambra, and um, they have a vigil right now. And I'm a, I need to get. I need to get there. I thought we would be done by now, but Chuck, you know how I feel about the next matter. Um, I just ask that you keep us in your prayers because Alhambra, Monterey Park, Pico Rivera, Montebello, it's like Louisville, Longmont, Boulder, um, Superior, Bol Bromfield. It's the same. We're the same. So I ask that you keep us in your thoughts. And um, Chuck, I'm going to pass it off to you if you don't mind to handle the last two. Oh, that's fine. Thank you. And uh, good luck. Thank you very much.
Thank you, everybody. Appreciate, appreciate your support. Take care. Hey, we have no uh, next item is action items. We have none. And then matters for discussion information. We have none. Uh, no, we already did those. So now we're to matters for board members. So matters for the board, we have uh, hybrid meetings, uh, discussion about how we want to move forward with hybrid meetings. And then um, we're going to discuss Elliot's um, proposal to uh, what was your proposal? Oh, handbook. Oh, the handbook. Or is it to the uh, crab handbook? Yeah, I don't have a proposal yet. I'm just going to initiate the process. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, so hybrid meetings. Um, do you have anything for us, Ali, on how, how we're going to do hybrid meetings in the future? How we're going to handle public participation? Yeah, the, so um, this item, these three options, um, or three comments came aboard about as Rosa and Chuck and Pam and I were coordinating for the first meeting. One was just um, for civic dialogue, making sure that board members know that um, even board members should refrain from using the chat so that all comments are recorded for the community. So um, the best way if you have something to add is to raise your hand. As Pam noted earlier, both she and Rosa are monitoring the chat. So if something does need to be said out loud, uh, it will be. And then for attendance, we wanted to call out that as we publish your packet, we're going to we're going to share what we believe to be the tenants that'll help with food planning. It'll help with the chair and vice chair with meeting facilitation. It'll also also help make sure we have a quorum. And so I think that what we thought is we would assume you're going to be there virtually in, or in person unless we hear otherwise, but that um, you all can decide if you want us to do that differently, if that's helpful, we find it helpful for meeting planning. Um, and then finally, when we published the packet, we were wanting to get information for you. There was a question of, could you choose to have a virtual only meeting? Uh, we did hear back from the city attorney's office on this and, and you can, um, I'm going to pull up, I want to pull up the language from the city attorney really quick, if that's okay. Just to, so here's city council in advance of, um, this discussion where meetings went hybrid updated the city charter to allow for remote or I'll say I say virtual because remote in workforce language means you're like in another state. So we're just saying virtual, regardless of where you are, you are virtually uh, participating. And so uh, I'm going to stop talking for a minute so that I can find this quickly, this language. The important thing to balance, uh, I'm still looking, but the important thing that we have to balance is that, that the meeting of the community and the public is conducted in public. And so the PRAB cannot decide to have a meeting where the public is not able to participate. So if your meeting is entirely virtual, then the public has to be able to participate um, entirely virtual. Rosa, are you able to, I, I, for the life of me, I'm trying, I'm looking in my email to find, oh, I know, because I filed it in an important place, so it's not. <laughs> <laughs> This is this is the problem with violating. <laughs> well, we're going to document. This is part of what should get documented in your handbook. Is this language? And Elliot, I think I forwarded it to you so that you were aware of um, this direction and this conversation. So, City attorney weighed in to give us the exact language that said, basically, you can have a meeting or in person, you can have a meeting virtual only, but if you are virtual only, the public should be able to participate. Um, it, it should be only because of a public health reason is when you should be virtual only, or if there's no opportunity for public engagement. So, for example, city council, Boulder City Council has elected that their business meetings are going to be in person. Um, board members may participate virtually if they need to, but in general, they will strive for in-person participation. Their study sessions don't have public engagement, so they are entirely virtual. So really the key trigger here is if there's public engagement, you wanna allow people the opportunity to either come speak to you in person 
or virtually. We know that people have preferences both ways. This has been one of the great learnings of the pandemic. Um, for public engagement, we've seen members of the community participate who never would before because they're not going to come down to the Tate building on a Monday night. We know some people that find that a barrier. And so that if there's a meeting that has public engagement, the meeting should be hybrid. So that's the general guidance. I will find that language and I'll, I think I passed it to Elliot just to put in his folder that he's going to start for this handbook. I sent you the Oh, bless you. Yes. Hold, please. I'll see if I missed something. I think I got the gist of it, but. And, and will we technically be capable of handling hybrid meetings on every meeting? Can we just pause right now and give Rosa a few notes? It's on very well, yes. right? Like, so, yes. Depends on the facility, though, right? If we're meeting in this room, it's going to work. If we're meeting somewhere else, so here's that's something for you to think about. In the past, the Pratt had rotated where you had meetings. There are three spaces citywide that are set up to facilitate a hybrid board meeting. You will be limited in where your meetings can be if they're to be hybrid. Um, so the key message from Sandra is that the city's board of commission's ability to exclude or limit the public from in-person attendance is limited to meetings where there's a public health or safety concern. So if you're meeting in person, the public has to be allowed to be attended. Um, and there's no prohibition on meetings taking place completely virtually where both the members of the public and board members are virtual. So I did misread that. You can have a meeting in person. You can have it hybrid whenever and as much as you want. You can have it virtual as much as you want, but the members of the public have to be included. Gotcha. So I believe that where we left it last time was that we were going to push for in-person to the extent possible with people who were out of town on travel or had other family reasons they couldn't attend, excused and able to attend remotely. Is that something that we're comfortable continuing like that? Do we want to continue to push for in-person to the extent possible? I wish Anita was here because she really is, I think, a proponent of, uh, you know, having the option with her disabled husband and childcare issues, um, just so she could weigh in. I'm but, here, Mary. Oh, good. Oh, good. So then I would love to hear your input on this. It's like she's I can me. hear you. Yeah, I, I just would love to hear very much your particular opinion on this subject, if you wouldn't mind. No, I don't, but do you mind repeating the question? Because I lost a little bit of the audio. Thank you. Well, Chuck, do you want to restate? I mean, I don't know. Sure. sure. Uh, I, I think that where we left it, Anita, was that we were... Um, we were most comfortable with having in person to the extent possible with the um, exceptions of people who are on travel or who had family uh, emergencies or issues that'll, that require them to attend remotely. Um, so with, a, with the emphasis on in person with a backup being remote. Thank you. Um, I, oh, hold on one second. I'm trying to do the, I don't have a, an option for video, I apologize. So I always prefer in person, even though at times it might be difficult, but I just feel like it's more beneficial. So I do prefer in person with the option of doing virtual when, um, when it's just challenging. That's my opinion, thank you. Great, thanks for your info, that's very useful. Is there anyone with a um, with a different viewpoint that would like to express it now, or the same viewpoint for that matter? I, I, I just agree. Agree. want to make sure we're not, you know, that we're considering thing people, persons, um, abilities that we might not even be thinking of right now, just because it's not our life. Um, yeah, you know, single moms persons in wheelchairs, you know, things of that nature who really would like to be more involved, but can't, or as someone without a car who it's really a production to get, you know, 
just want to, because if we decide this, I mean, obviously it could always be changed, but I just want to make sure that we're getting a wide range of options for anyone who might apply to the board. That's all. I think this gives us a preference, but with the flexibility to handle people that, that are not able to attend in person. So. I just want to add something. I, I really appreciate everyone thinking about this because I feel the same way. I feel like if someone is committed to the meeting, they're going to try their best. But if they have a challenging situation or they can make it for some reason, I, I would love for them to have the option because they can still um, they can still be great members and and cooperate a lot. Yeah, I, I agree, Anita. That's a very good point. Okay, I think we're in agreement on this. So um, I guess it sort of moves us naturally toward the, the um, Pratt Handbook because this would be incorporated into the Pratt Handbook. That's correct. Yeah. Um, so I think we've, at the last meeting or the last two meetings, we've discussed the need to update the Pratt Handbook because it is, you know, wildly out of date um, for a variety of reasons. And um, I had volunteered to take a look at the handbook. I know, Chuck, you've looked at it as well, and you know you agree with that point that it needs to be updated. Um, I would propose that uh, a subset of us be delegated to, you know, actually tackling the revisions and, you know, proposing edits to the full board um, for their consideration. And I'm happy to be part of that subset of people in concert with uh, staff from the department, of course, to make sure that we're uh, doing things correctly and need to you know, consult with the city attorney's office where necessary. So I'm, I'm proposing that as a plan and I'm more than happy to be part of the subset and I'm more than happy to like spearhead the whole effort, but I do need the help of at least one additional crowd member on this effort um, because I don't have all the answers, so. So I think uh, we are limited to having one additional person because beyond that, it becomes a meeting, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so is there a Pratt member who would like to participate with Elliot on this topic? Understanding that we don't have Jason and Pamela's gone. Um, I mean, I would, but I mean, graduate school is really challenging. I, so, I, I feel like it would be remiss to not have do a little bit of it before Pamela and I leave, just because we do have the five years and at least have some, I don't know, everybody should have some input. Um, but I, I don't know that I'm up to being the main person. I don't know, um, Elliot, what do you think? I mean, 20 hours, six hours to get through it? Yeah, I think 20 is probably more accurate um, in terms of actually re you know reviewing what needs to be updated and then um, you know revising and I kind of pour over stuff probably longer than I need to just because that's what I do for a living. Um, but uh, you know in terms of timing, when is your last meeting, Mary? Well, I believe it's March and then uh, we pass the baton. So April, we show up for 10 minutes and obviously it's more of an alley question. I think we say hi, goodbye in April and then you guys, the new people get sworn in. Is that right, Allie? Uh, the goodbye is typically at the March meeting. So uh, that's what I mean, Elliot. There, yeah. I don't also have, we don't have a lot of time, Pamela and I, but I'd love to, see it before it moves on into yeah getting published. that shouldn't be a problem so um we could shoot for having um when's the february meeting again seven so it's about 27 it, and it could be i guess a proposed uh, a moderate path forward could be that elliot consults we, we have the handbook in a Word document. You could have Mary and Pam with their knowledge and tenure could cite flags of areas where they think like this is an issue because, and not be tasked with the solving of the issue and they get the easy job of just 
saying what doesn't work and why it's an issue if, if yeah. you don't want to compress the time frame too much. Here's what I propose. I think that this is a prab wide project with some people who are spearheading the effort to actually put pen to paper. So what I would propose is that we have an ass homework assignment um, for the PRAB where we are all tasked with between now and the February meeting going through the handbook and reading it, identifying areas that we believe need to be updated and discussing that at the meeting in February um, and actually having robust discussion. You know, it could be a five minute discussion, but at least where we as a group go through and target things we want to um, fix, because that is a time when we're all going to be here um, and it's going to be an official meeting. And then between the February 27th and the official March meeting, not the study session, um, we will bring proposed revisions to the group. And that way you guys get to have input in your last meeting of what the revisions look like. And then we may not actually say, this is it. We may say we need to do some more from that, or there's a chance we say, this is great. Let's adopt this as our new uh, handbook. That's my proposal. I think it might be nice though, to get as far as we can by the March meeting and then have a little something for the new people to, to do. I mean, I know they're new, you know, the brand new members, but to before they even get here to put something in place that they're going to be a part of for five years. It seems a little um, like we're speeding through it. I don't know. I know it takes six months to kind of get one's head wrapped around the the position. But if you think it's that easy, Elliot, just to kind of do a few revisions and turn it out. You know, it's an interesting point about um, collaborating with the newbies. I just, uh, I mean, I, I think we should give them the opportunity for sure to do that. So what we could do is if the April meeting is the, is their first meeting, we could present the proposed changes to them as part of the packet and, you know, encourage them to read revisions. And then at the meeting, they can, uh, we can have a discussion about those proposed revisions. And if they want to comment on them and propose any changes, they can. And we can always decide to allow an additional month of review. I mean, handbook revisions uh, for boards typically take a long time um, because they're, <laughs> they've existed for a while and it's hard to change things like that because it involves procedures that are going to last a lot longer than the members that are currently sitting on the board. So if this goes on for a couple months uh, beyond March, I'm fine with that. And I agree we should involve the, the new board members as well. I just wanted to make sure you guys have adequate input in it. I also think in the welcome letter, that was one of my contributions to years ago, that maybe you could even have um, a, you know, welcome to the PRAB and please read the handbook because our first meeting, it just, it's nice being when you're a new member to have something that you actually are tasked to do instead of just passively and sheepishly sitting there like, ah, what should I be doing? Kind of for more fun and engaged to come in with something you're already supposed to have kind of looked at. Yeah, yeah. this will get them to read the handbook too. So. Yeah, I'd be supportive of, of your idea, and I'd be happy to read the handbook and provide you with comments Great. before the next meeting. Great, awesome. I ask a clarifying question just to make sure that the next step happens. Are you stewarding this assignment and getting the information to each board member? Or what is, I'm just thinking functionally, what does that look like? So, Especially because Pam's not here and Jason's not here. I think that staff should disseminate the existing the words, to all members. Yep. Um, and th that way I don't have to reach out to everybody and, you know, yep. cause a meeting. Um, and then we all come to the next meeting with our thoughts on where to revise. And then after that, um, I and the other person working with me should have a pretty good idea of what we want to do. And maybe we filter edits. If people use a Word document, we filter those edits through staff so you can compile them. Um, and that could be something we discuss at the next meeting. Yep. 
So I think Rosa will just be your project manager for this. Great. Okay. So yeah, so right now it's really all of us are are tasked with coming to the next meeting with some proposed edits. And obviously that's not gonna, it's not like everybody has to solve all the problems between now and the next meeting, but it's a good chance for us to really dig in and figure out what do we want to change, especially for people who are going to be on this board for a number of years. Like there's an incentive to make this this process smooth and make sure the handbook is clear. Can I make a technical suggestion? Yeah. And I don't know if this will cause a private meeting. But if Rose, if you were able to share it from your OneDrive, everyone could work on the same document and see the edits. Too. I would advise against that, um, but I <laughs> like the idea. The efficiency is <laughs> good. <laughs> you follow the rules. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I do would ask that you consider, to, as you get into this process, how to avoid wordsmithing and, and group, like just because um, that's very chat. Well, it's, you've done it with boards, it sounds like. So you'll have yep. trips and tips and tricks to make it not painful. Yeah. So focus on concepts and issues, not words. That would, that, that would be great advice to have in mind. Okay. Yeah. Big picture stuff. Okay. Um, Allie, something that I just thought of, or maybe more Rosa. Um, in the old days, we used to have name, big name plates when we were in the chambers. Um, and I think with um, hybrid, especially, it's very helpful to, you know, especially for new people or community members to be see, to oh, be reading yeah. people's names. Yep, we'll follow up on that tomorrow. Thank you so much, Mary. We'll get them order to make sure we have them for the February meeting. Yep. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, I think the final item is Prad Matters. This is your chance to bring up any interactions you've had with community members that you want to bring to the attention of the uh, of the crowd, uh, anything you've heard, anything that you've participated in. And didn't we decide, Chuck, that it's also any concerns or questions or comments that we want to put in? Yes, th those that are not better handled by direct communication with staff. Th those that you want to bring to the attention of the crowd overall, yes. So I'll open it up for anyone who has anything they'd like to mention. Discuss. I'll just mention that I was lucky enough to go over to North Boulder when we had a big snow, and that was awesome. It was just full of people. We were able to leave a group of kids at the park and actually get around on our own, and it was it was just marvelous. So you were at the park, not the recreation center. We were at the North Boulder. Um, Thank you. Park. Yes. Um, Thank you. Sorry, we were skiing. And the kids were making snowmen. So it was just really cool seeing lots of people enjoying the weather and the snow and the groomed, groomed trail. So good stuff. And then that grooming is done by the. It's done by a partnership with Boulder Nordic Club. It's Boulder awesome. Nordic. They do it there and they do it at Foothills Community Park. And it costs us nothing other than coordinating with them. And right. it's, it's pretty cool. And they do take donations if you really enjoyed it. Um, I met with, uh, or I've communicated with the veterans group who was concerned about the Bill Bauer Park, and they wanted to express their appreciation for communications they've had with staff and are moving forward and getting, or at least uh, making some progress toward getting that uh, plaque installed and maybe something bigger. So thank you, staff, from them. That's Tina's work. Make sure she knows. On that note, I um, I think is again being outgoing. I really, really like the idea of just placards everywhere explaining parks. I love the ones at NCAR, the nature ones. I think it, it is a really yeah. big contribution of a city to citizens and visitors and such to have everything from the name changes at the parks, you know, to weather patterns and such. So. I just want to put that that plug in that's been on my mind. And on that vein, I spoke to a community uh, community member, my my wife, who's <laughs> having placards for tree species at some part for some subset of the trees. So especially parks that have a wide variety of trees, like North Boulder Park again. Um, say this is a whatever. We, unfortunately, the government issue. Uh, generally speaking, for those disappearing, interestingly, yeah. the collector's items. Um, 
But it, it's such a good idea because it's so helpful when we can do it. And there is a. Um, Maybe we can do QR codes. Well, as we can. And there is. Can I just play you one second? Um, it's called the science officer at OSMP gave me this app. It's called Seek. And you put your camera next to the tree and it'll identify the species. That's, that's, that's right. a fantastic tool. Yeah, we've been, we've been uh, going to that. It's kind of nice to know when you're looking at it. I agree. Yeah, quickly. It is. And because you know we were thinking of new trees for our house, and then we see that's a beautiful tree, and we like how it changes color and how it looks all throughout the seasons. What is it? You know, like... Chuck, are you aware of the resource on our forestry page about recommended species for Boulder in our comment? Yes. Yes. Very useful. Yeah. Good. Okay. Anyone else uh, for prime matters? Okay. I think that concludes our agenda. First, good job, Rosa. Uh, so, with no further business in the crowd, uh, I guess we will adjourn the meeting. Thank you all for your patience. Thanks, Chuck.